Good evening, everyone. It is 5.30 p.m. and I now call to order the Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education meeting. This is the March 15th, 2021 meeting. Notice of this meeting has been advertised in the Grand Island Independent, which is a district's designated method of giving notice of these meetings. We want those in attendance to know that copies of the Open Meetings Act are available at the entrance to the boardroom. If anyone in attendance is interested in addressing our board, you are welcome to do so. We simply request that you complete the appropriate form and turn it in to us now so that you may be recognized during the public forum part of this meeting. These forms are also located by the entry doors of this room. Mrs. Simmons, will you please call the roll? Mrs. Hinkle. Present. Mrs. Albers. Present. Mr. Brown. Present. Mrs. Jurgens. Present. Mr. Barsinus. Yes. Mr. Hawley. Present. Ms. Wolf. Here. Dr. Bros. Here. Mr. Holinsky. Here. All right, thank you. Agenda item three is our mission statement. Mr. Brown, will you please read that for us? Every student, every day, a success. In educating students, we teach hearts as well as minds. Student commitments. Within the school district of Grand Island, every student will be taught to read, write, and communicate effectively. Solve problems, acquire and apply knowledge, and demonstrate mastery through performance to the best of the student's ability. Every student will be treated with fairness and dignity. Every student will be honored for their unique qualities and backgrounds. Every student will experience a self, self sense of belonging, contribution, and success, and every student will develop responsibilities and show respect for others as well as oneself. Thank you very much. Agenda item four is the public forum portion of our meeting. Is there anyone in attendance that would like to address the board? I didn't see any forms. All right, so we'll move forward to the consent agenda. On the consent agenda tonight, we have 5.1, the minutes from the previous month's meeting. 5.2, claims as submitted. 5.3, bid proposals as submitted. 5.4, staff adjustments as submitted. 5.5, treasurer's report as submitted. 5.6, policies, which include 9310, fundraising activities on final read. 9311, donations of collectibles, gifts, grants, and bequests on final read. 5310, transportation on first read. And 5.7, the approval of the agenda as submitted. Uh, just a minute, let me get back up here. So this, um, this is the consent agenda as published. Would anyone like to remove any items or add any items to the consent agenda? Mrs. Albers. I would like to amend item 5.7, approval of agenda to include an additional information item. 6.13 would be approval, accreditation, and accountability rule development, NASB presentation, and recommend we approve the consent agenda as submitted with the change to the agenda as noted. And is there a second? Second, Mr. Brown. Um, just for discussion purposes, uh, this uh, presentation by the NASB will be at 7.30. And so at 7.30, we'll stop wherever we're at and join a Zoom. It's supposed to take about 10 minutes and then come back to the regular meeting. Any other discussion or questions on that? If not, please vote. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> We will move on to our information items. The first one is 6.1, Campus Highlights, Dodge Elementary Restorative, Restorative Practices Impact. Sorry, <laughs> Dr. Palmer. Good evening, everybody. This is the favorite part of the meeting. My favorite part of the meeting is just sharing some of the exciting things that our um, campuses are doing to help support students and um, live out our strategic plan in different ways. So I'm going to share some videos. They're not joining us live, but I'm going to share some videos. Um, and, but they're all watching. So they all said that they would encourage their families and that they would be um, watching as well. So I think you'll be able to see. Um, get some feedback from them. Okay, and of course I had it up and now I don't. There we go. All right. Love Dodge Elementary. And 
December of 2019, we shared with the school board our beginning stages of restorative practices at Dodge. I'm pleased to share with you the next steps we have taken and the impact it is making on our students. Our restorative practices continue to connect to goals number six and number seven of our district strategic plan. In our first stages, as shared at the last board presentation, teachers were learning to create respect agreements and how to run effective restorative circles in their classrooms. Respect agreements remain as the documented expectations in every classroom developed by students. Now students are able to reflect and connect behaviors to respect agreements. Looking at our respect agreements, what area did you do well at? Okay. Okay. So you do well at treating others so that you want to be treated. You do a good job at that. Next. A regular routine now is weekly circles. Sometimes a classroom issue comes up that needs to be addressed immediately and a circle is the means to work the issue out within the classroom. Circles are usually held with whole classes, but we have extended our use of circles with small groups of students, with teacher teams, and with parents. To move our restorative practices further, we created a team who receive extra training and have become a support to the rest of our Dodge staff. Our team consists of myself, our assistant principal, guidance counselor, social worker, Title I instructional coach, two classroom teachers, our SECL coach, and school psychologist. We developed a vision for restorative practices in our building, which is to develop and restore relationships within our Dodge community using school-wide restorative practices by empowering teachers with restorative theories and strategies. After further training this past summer, our restorative practices team created a Dodge decision tree to help guide teachers in steps to take when students display undesirable behaviors. Based on the behavior, the teacher either makes a redirection, sends a student to the classroom focus seat, or makes an office referral. As you can see, there are further steps after a focus seat or office decision, but the end result is always to restore relationships before re-entering the classroom. The alternative we use for in-school suspension is called a structured day. Students still attend all core classes, but other times of the day are spent in the office working on an accountability project which matches and corrects the undesired behavior. Here are examples of parts of accountability projects. Students have also created slideshows to present to their classes. This is a comparison of Dodge office referrals compared to the typical average to maintain. 93% of our students have only zero to one office referrals, which is a higher percentage than average. Where 10 to 15% of students typically have two to five office referrals, only 4% of Dodge students fall in this category. Only 3% of our students have more than five referrals, which is lower than the average 5%. This graph shows our restorative practices data, as well as our positive office referrals, which are in green. Positive office referrals get announced each morning. Students get their picture taken with a certificate, which has a personalized note from the teacher who awarded it. Our teachers have given 530 positive office referrals so far this year. In addition to their positive office referral certificates, students earn a brag tag to add to their chain, which we started the school year. Students also earn brag tags for their birthdays, increasing scores on assessments, and other special occasions. Students keep these brag tags attached to their backpacks. Restorative practices has been key in addressing the social emotional needs of our students at Dodge. The teamwork of our staff and restorative practices leadership team have made these efforts successful. We will end with a sample conversation in a kindergarten circle about respect. Logan, what can you do if someone is not showing you respect? Um, I can um, tell So if you have any questions, I can sure take those back to the Dodge team or to Mrs. Eberly and to get those answered for you. Any questions? 
I would just say I'm incredibly impressed. It was so good to see those statistics that they shared because being in the original discussions, what was that in the spring of 2019 when we did that? And knowing how desperately they wanted to make changes and improvements, this is just overwhelming. And I'm just, I'm so proud of them because they rose to the challenge as teachers and administrators and staff to make it happen. And wow, pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah, they've definitely become some leaders in the district in this area, and um, they're, they're, they continue the work. They realize that there are still some things that they're learning, um, but they're, they're not afraid to, to dive in and, and try something new. But um, I think just being able to celebrate um, the things that are working and just see the ownership in the kids, um, I think, is part of their best celebration. And, so. and I just have to believe that this is going to have a lifelong impact on the kids, you know, as they continue through the school system, and that's so exciting. So Such a great skill. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. All right, next I think you have something from Walnut Middle School. Yes, so um, Walnut Middle School, they're all watching as well, but I think you're really going to enjoy how uh, the Walnut uh, team has been um, implementing live streaming. And so they have a group of students that are actually, um, you know, heading this up and, and um, run this for, for Walnut School every day. So you're going to learn a little bit about that. All right. Four, three, two, one, go. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rod Foley. I'm the principal at Walnut Middle School, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for our campus highlights. So to our Board of Education and Dr. Grover, thanks for the opportunity to let us share one of the really great things, uh, one of the great innovative things that we've been able to do at Walnut, uh, and we've grown it over the last several years as our media club. So our media club under the direction of Ben Martin has kind of started out as just doing our daily morning announcements and connecting our students to the rest of the building every day uh, through the use of technology and live streaming our announcements straight to our classrooms. So we're able to do remote announcements, we're able to do uh, announcements all over the building and then live stream those into classes every day. And before even the pandemic hit, we began to do some live streaming of our concerts and uh, other events here at school. And so uh, as we've gone into the pandemic and needed to be able to reach out to our parents more through our activities since they're not able to come in and join us, uh, we've been able to even add the live streaming of all of our games and activities. Uh, and excitingly enough, even have announcers at our, at our games as well, which I think is maybe one of the most exciting things that we've had happen. So I hope you enjoy this opportunity to see a little bit more about our Walnut Media Club. One thing I've learned here in Morning Announcements is how to work a teleprompter. And one thing I have learned from Morning Announcements is public speaking. Hello, this is Mrs. Bruning. I'm one of the assistant principals here at Walnut. I have loved the opportunity to address our students and staff in our morning announcements. Um, one of the things that's been a tradition now for me during my time is to help connect them to our behind the scenes people. So we've been in our cafeteria, we've been in our kitchen, we've in, even been in our maintenance room so that students can meet our custodians and our cafeteria workers and our behind the scenes people and see the areas that they work and how they serve us here. I've also loved the tradition of riddles at Breakfast with Bruning on Mondays. And so I love seeing kids throughout the building come up and say that they've solved the riddle of the day and tell me the answer. So that's been a fun connection. I also often highlight our SEL work. So whatever our themes are that we're covering during Wildcat time, um, we do that too. So when we did our one word challenge in January, we went to different places, different classrooms where those words were posted and featured how kids were picking their one word. So it's been an awesome way for me to connect with staff and students. I have had the opportunity to do Wardeen Wednesdays on the morning announcements live for the last few years. And it's been a great opportunity for me to be able to connect with the kids at a different level. And I have kids come up to me during the day and they'll say, hey, it's Wardeen Wednesday, or hey, you said my name on Wardeen Wednesday, or Ms. Wardeen, what's the challenge gonna be today on Wardeen Wednesday? So I know the kids are paying attention and they're connecting and they're hearing what we say in a whole different format. And I, I think it's been so good that even when we were in the COVID shutdown, it wasn't nearly as, um, as in, intricate as the media center crew would put it on, but I did my own with my cell phone, Wardeen Wednesdays, and sent it out to kids on Wednesday mornings because it just became something that I thought we needed to continue to do. 
I'm Georgia, and what I like to do is work the computer. Hi, my name is Brian, and my favorite position on the camera crew is the camera. Hi, my name is Johnny Arcos, and my favorite part about being in the basketball camera crew is is commentating. Hi, my name is Brayden, and like my favorite position to do while uh, we are videoing the games is commentating. Hey, I'm Coach Ray here at Walnut Middle School. I uh, coach uh, most of sports here. Well, 20 seconds left. He passes the ball to six. Six then has the ball. He passes it to 47. He shoots. And he makes it. It'll be two to two. There was a time when I had to quarantine. Uh, my team, uh, one week, they had three games. On Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And he gets over. And 24 has it. He shoots. Um, it was the first time in... This is my 25th year of coaching here. So the first time in 25 years, I was not able to participate in coaching or being in the game. He passes it to 27. He passes 27. Passes it inside of 56. 56. And I was able to watch the games on Walnut's Facebook page. And I actually still continue to do some coaching. I would uh, send text messages, <laughs> and uh, it was pretty cool. So you can see we've got some pretty talented uh, students coming up, uh, ready for that media and communications uh, academy as they get up to senior high. I think we're in good hands. Yes, um, any definitely. other questions? Any questions or comments? Yeah, very, very cool. So thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. All right, we will move to 6.3, which is the winter data update. Uh, Dr. Bills and Ms. Crow. So Dr. Bills and Ms. Crow are going to um, be sharing some information um, with you about our, um, our, our assessment results uh, from our Dibbles um, data, which that was something that we transitioned to this year um, as we are looking at our K2 reading and want to give you an update on how our students are doing um, at this point, as well as, um, you know, we've had our fall and our winter map assessments, and so we want to just kind of share with you where we are um, with our data, what, that's, um, what information that's providing to us as a team at this time, how uh, buildings, uh, principals, and their teams are using the data and how um, we are responding to it as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Bills. in here thank you All right, good evening, Dr. Grover, President Hinkle, and other members of the board. Um, I am excited to share um, some updated data for um, winter dibbles for kindergarten and first grade with you. Um, so <clears throat> um, we have some national data, um, how our students performed in comparison to other students nationally um, from Amplify. Um, reading or amplify and um, I want to start with fall because I think it helps to kind of set the picture of of where our kids started and, and the the growth that they've made and the impact um, of the instructional decisions that we've made as a district have had on our students so um, you can see from this chart that the pandemic hit our earliest readers particularly hard 69% um, of our kindergartners entered kindergarten well below benchmark in comparison to 49% of students nationally. Um, and we had fewer students who were at or above benchmark in comparison to um, other students nationally in kindergarten and first grade. Um, our first graders look pretty similar to the national trends um, in terms of performance and where we, we entered school in the fall. And when we look at how that data shifted um, after the winter benchmark, it's exciting to see that we have fewer students nationally in kindergarten and first grade who are well below benchmark, and we have more students um, who are at benchmark 
um, in both kindergarten and first grade in comparison to those national trends. Um, what's even more exciting, though, is to look at the growth that our students have made in kindergarten and first grade in comparison to national trends as well. So when we look, this is kindergarten data. Um, when we look at students who are at benchmark and above benchmark, um, nationally about 60% of students are making average to well above average growth. Um, and you can see here that we had 81% and 96% of our kindergartners demonstrating that same type of growth. Uh, when you move to below benchmark and well below benchmark, nationally only about 40% of kids are making what they refer to as gap closing growth, right? So it has to be ambitious, above average and well above average. Um, our students who were well below, we had 65% of our kindergartners demonstrating that type of growth and 79% um, of our kindergartners demonstrating that, that type of growth. Um, the middle column breaks down those categories really specifically. Um, and I think it's just a huge celebration that even within that 79% of students, 53% of them made well above average growth, um, which is just huge. So when we, sh <laughs> yes, it's really exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, so when we shift to first grade, we see um, very similar trends. Um, so again, at an above benchmark, we'd see about 60% nationally, um, and we have 87% of our students above benchmark and 91% of our students um, at benchmark who are demonstrating that same type of growth. Um, when we shift to the below and well below categories, 68% um, of our students who are below in comparison to 40% made that gap closing growth and 45% of students in first grade who are well below made that gap closing growth. Um, so just wanna share a little bit of, about what we've done with this data in response to this data. Uh, so we've conducted some regular classroom walks with instructional specialists at Amplify. Um, those have been done virtually. So myself, the principal, the instructional coach, um, we observe classroom instruction and then a specialist at Amplify gives us feedback on what's going really well and where we can make um, improvements in our implementation of CKLA. Um, at our January CIA meeting, um, our first grade teachers really dug into that data, um, that growth data, and um, went through a protocol to target those kids who were below and not making adequate growth. Um, that protocol had them reflecting upon the intervention supports that they were providing to students um, and what changes they could make um, to improve that data come spring. Um, this growth data was too good not to share with teachers. Um, so I put together a little screencastify um, ahead of spring break and just shared the data with them, celebrated their hard work, um, and encouraged them to take some much needed time off for themselves. Um, and then we have also disaggregated all of this data by building, um, and that data has been shared with principals and coaches um, so that they can use it to drive um, decisions as well. So that is our K-1 data. Do you have any questions for me? Any questions, Mr. Helensky? I always last ask the why and how. Uh, obviously, the scores are great scores, don't get me wrong, but how, what, are, what are our educators doing different that on national we're so much higher than them because we have to understand how we're doing that and why, and why we're doing it to keep it to keep going up. So what are they doing differently, do we know? Um, so I can't, I can't speak to like what it is specifically that we're doing differently than other schools nationally, right? Because there's so many variables that come into play. What I can speak to is what we're doing differently this year that we haven't done in years past. And that is um, provide our students with structured foundational literacy skill instruction um, using CKLA skills. Um, and so I, I do uh, um, equate our growth and our student success to um, that resource and our teachers strong implementation of that resource. Um, overwhelmingly the classroom observations that we've done with Amplify, they're very impressed with the level of implementation of our teachers. Um, they've done an excellent job um, of just picking it up and, and running with it. So I would say it's that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions or comments? 
All right. Well, yes, it's pretty amazing. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. All right. So then, oh, you're, do, is this still part of 6.3? Okay. Got it. <laughs> Good evening. As Dr. Plummer said, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, <laughs> our winter map growth data. Um, just to sort of reorient ourselves to what MAP is, it's, MAP is a computer adaptive assessment, which means it adjusts the questions students are getting based on their responses. So if they're answering correctly, they get harder questions. If they're answering incorrectly, they get easier questions until the system finds a place where they're getting about 50% correct and 50% incorrect. This is nationally normed data, and most of our students will take this assessment three times per year. Um, just a little more basic data, um, uh, as far as who takes which test, our kindergartners and first graders um, are only taking the math test now because they take dibbles for reading. Our second through fifth take math and reading, and our fifth graders um, take the science assessment. For our middle schoolers, sixth, seventh, and eighth all take math, reading, and science. And for our high school, grades nine through 11 take math, reading, science, and language usage. You will see in the data that we have some Places where the data looks a little different, such as for juniors in the spring, they take the ACT instead of the math a third time, and we are piloting some content math assessments in the high school as well. And before we dive in, just a note about the norms. We did get new map growth norms as of this fall, and it's important to keep those in mind as we're looking at these, this data because those norms were generated pre-COVID. So they were from 15, 16, 16, 17, and 17, 18. So when, for example, we're looking at growth, we're comparing our students' growth this year in the middle of a pandemic to what we would expect to see in the, the data that was gathered pre-COVID. So, okay, it's a little hard to see the colors on here, but um, map growth is a lot to take in. It's all grade levels, uh, multiple content areas. What I was trying to do here was to give some context to what we're seeing with our COVID data. So we've got um, 18, 19, 19, 20, and 2021 20, data here. And if you can kind of see the colors, what I tried to do was make it easy to trace a grade, a, a cohort of students down through second, third, fourth grade. So you can kind of follow the patterns. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> so for fourth grade, for example, you'll see here we went 49th, 46th, 54th, 56th. We were kind of seeing a general um, nice upward trend. Then this is where COVID hit, and you see them down to 40, the 41st percentile, the 35th percentile. Fifth grade, uh, 44th, 52nd, 54th, 50th, and then here COVID comes into play, and we say, see them at the 41st and 35th percentile. So you'll see that overall as a trend. And what I tried to capture here at the bottom is just, and it's not necessarily best practice in data analysis, but it, it works for this. Um, just the average percentile gain or loss if you look across all grade levels. So you'll see here pre-COVID we had, you know, 0.36, um, 3.36, fall to winter there, so we were making nice growth. And then over here within this year, fall to winter, we, we are negative 5.2 percentile. Between years from the winter to fall, here we were plus 3, and here in COVID, minus 12.5. So you can definitely see that disrupted learning um, reflected in our map data. Oops, I missed the slide. This is a, another report that kind of shows it a different way. This is our student growth summary report. We call it the diamond swallowing report sometimes. So when you see these orange diamonds, that's the projected growth that students would be expected to make. This is during a normal year with that norm data collected pre-COVID. Um, and then the blue bars are what our students actually did. It's their observed growth. So you want to see this blue bar swallowing the diamond. So this is fall to winter of 2020. So you'll see we were doing actually a pretty good job of swallowing the diamond there. And when you look at our fall to winter um, for this year, you see a lot more diamonds um, hanging out there above the bar, which is indicating that our students aren't growing as we would project them to in a typical year. Oops, I keep clicking too far. Okay, so our math takeaways. Um, generally, students started the year with greater than usual loss from last winter to this fall. Most grade levels appear to be growing at a slower rate than previous years, which does align to what NWEA has um, seen nationwide. 
they do fairly regular updates to tell us like what are the nationwide trends and what we see here does align with that. Some celebrations, um, NWA said that like fourth, fifth grade-ish math skills were the most fragile skills um, that they, where they saw the most loss during the pandemic. So our fifth graders um, have grown the most this year, which is an, a good sign that they're rebounding some from that, from last spring and the loss um, encountered there. And our kindergartners are performing at the 76th percentile, which is also a celebration. We have the same um, data here for reading, and you'll see those same numbers across the bottom. I can't hover over it, it hides it, but um, you'll see that we are making some nice growth in the years leading up to COVID. And then here, you know, we lost eight percentile here within the year from fall to winter. We lost nine. And when I say we lost it, it's not like our students went backwards. What that really means is they didn't keep pace with the expected growth again. So the same diamond swallowing report, you'll see last year we were doing, well, winter, uh, fall to winter 2020, a nice job of swallowing the diamond. Here again, you'll see a lot of diamonds um, hanging out above that, meaning we're not meeting that projected growth, excuse me. And K1, if you're wondering why they're missing, it's because they took dibbles, so that's why you don't see their data there. So our takeaways in reading, students experience loss between winter and fall, not as pronounced as math, but within year, those percentile losses um, indicate more difficulty sort of keeping pace than in a typical year. And finally, this is, um, map data is a piece of our on track to thrive data. So this is really uh, about projected proficiency onto the um, end of the year state summative assessments. So MAP can correlate how a student does on the winter MAP or the fall MAP to how they will likely do on the state summative assessment. So this is just relative. The red is last year's projected proficiency for second, third, eighth, and ninth. And the blue is this year. So if you're just looking at it relatively, we're, we don't have as many students projected that would be projected to meet proficiency this year on the state summative assessment, except for in ninth grade where you kind of see a reverse of that data. And ninth grade would actually be projected um, onto the ACT. Which does lead into sort of our summary takeaways. Um, the disruptions negatively impacted not only where we started the year, but the growth we've been able to make within the year. And that students in the upper grades have generally weathered those disruptions more successfully than those in the lower grades, particularly in ELA. So maybe we will let Dr. Tom Jack's going to talk about our response to this data, and then if people have questions after that, um, we'll take them then. Absolutely. So we've heard a little bit about the data, and the next piece that our Leading for Learning team has really been talking about is what do we do about the data? Because obviously we're not where we want to be, and we want to make sure that we're accelerating that learning for our kids as we go forward, trying to meet those gaps as much as we can and mitigate the losses from the pandemic. So. We have a couple things on the slide. We're, we're doing quite a few things, but I wanted to highlight a few of them. One is some really intentional planning around our summer learning opportunities and making sure there's opportunities available for elementary, middle, and high school. Just one example of some of the work we're doing at the elementary level is some really intentional planning at our Title I summer school for what the priority standards and lessons we're going to cover. Mikhail Happ from West Lawn is leading that charge for us this year. And we're meeting on Wednesday to talk through an intentional package of lessons that follows what NDE has told us are the priority standards to make sure our kids hit before next year. So really intentionally planning those summer opportunities. We've also had the chance through NDE to um, bring Zern to our district. It's a math intervention system that we can use and the state is providing that for free to us this summer and through next year. So all kids at the elementary level will have the opportunity to participate in that program, whether they're in a Title I building or a non-Title I building. And then task force work this summer will be really intentional about using the NDE priority standards documents that we've been given to make sure that we're focusing next year on those core skills that our kids need in order to be successful. Um, and also creating assessments that are going to help us gauge where they are in terms of their learning MAP is great, but it's only given three times a year. So really looking at ways that we can measure student progress throughout the semester um, before we get to MAP. 
Uh, reading support plans are another piece that's been put in place at a few of our Title I buildings. Dr. Bills has been working closely on some of those intervention support structures. We've seen some early successes, particularly at West Lawn. We've already had some kids graduate reading intervention um, by getting some intensive supports early on. So some exciting things happening there. Data analysis meetings with principals are happening with Dr. Dahl, Dr. Palmer, and Dr. Grover, really looking at the map data and analyzing next steps for each building in terms of that data and making some concrete plans moving forward. And then again, we're looking at those state standards within our curriculum and making sure we're having priority areas of focus. Tomorrow, our pre-K-12 math team is going to meet for the first time. That committee is really coming together with the charge of improving math instruction from preschool all the way up to 12th grade. So bringing together, it's about 20 people and a diverse representation of our teachers, our administrators, our coaches, um, and our best math expertise within the district to make a plan moving forward of how we're going to build uh, both the commitment for mathematics education, but also some streamlined plans for professional learning for teachers and some intentional curriculum processing opportunities. And then that last piece there, NDE has been providing a school renewal and acceleration professional learning series uh, that's really taking us through how we can ensure that we are doing everything we can to fill the gaps related to the pandemic. So, our L4L team is participating in those and really prioritizing how we build the plan that our task force will engage in in the summer using the Department of Education's guidance. Any questions for Kate or I? Anybody have any questions? Dr. Bros. <clears throat> this one might be for Dr. Palmer, but Dibbles. Are we happier with this newer edition of Dibbles than we were with the old version of Dibbles? <laughs> Is it giving us what we need to have it give us? For the first time, I feel, I feel like our teachers actually are armed with a diagnostic that really identifies what they need for intervention. And tied to that, and, and Dr. Bills didn't talk about, but the letters training is another piece of that as well. I think <coughs> teachers are more... Um, they, they definitely have that understanding of the science of reading. And so as they're using the Dibbles assessment, they're also thinking about, so how do I have to change my instruction to help meet those needs? And then M class as the progress monitoring tool provides teachers with some real specific strategies and resources that they can use to really address what's coming from the diagnostic. So I will say it's, it's probably the most comprehensive piece that we've had. So you talked about the training that teachers have had. Some have, some haven't. Mm -hmm. And I don't expect you to make this public, but have you looked at the data between the classrooms where teachers have had the training and where they have not had the training? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's just a yes or no. You don't have to give an explanation. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, that's really important for us as well because um, we've invested a lot of money in the letters training, and so it is important for us to look at that data. And, and the last comment I have has to do with my, <clears throat> I get a little angst over percentile scores versus normal curve equivalents. And it's pretty hard when you're looking at something at the 51st, 52nd, 53rd national percentile, knowing that those scores are so close together. So when you look at that, and again, I don't want to get into a debate, it's just, to me, it's better to look at growth when you look at how many normal curve equivalents kids are taking. I don't mean to show off for the rest of the board. It's just been a bugaboo of mine for a long, long time. Yeah, and MAP does present <clears throat> um, you know, the results in a lot of different ways. I mean, we can look at it. RIT score, some of it's just hard to, it's hard to understand, hard to communicate, you know, those differences. So we're really trying to use something that we can um, make sense of um, for others, but we're definitely looking, we actually just received another report, it's called the Insight Report from NWA, and they dig in a little bit deeper for us. And so those are things that we'll be able to also um, take that information and use that for the future. So thank you, thank you for your feedback. Do, do we know yet if there are going to be state assessments this year? So there, as normal, there's going to be, okay. Um, not exactly as normal. We are, we are having them. They're really, the NDE is really trying to get to next year, which is where 
MAP and NSCAS sort of merge and become one. So they don't want to burden people, but they needed to collect enough data to be able to move to that new system. So we are giving all the, the typical assessments, but they're abbreviated versions. And um, yeah, so, so we also are not sure what the data will look like. It may just be individual student data at this point. They're saying they're not going to aggregate data for us. And there won't be any new like AQUEST designations or classifications coming out next year. All of that will just continue forward. So, so then the bill that's in place for the third grade reading level, is will they still be applying the requirements within that even yes. though all this is happening? Okay. Yes. Th those will remain the same. Okay. Interesting. All right. Thank you for the information. Doesn't look like we have any other questions. Thank you. Okay, 6.4 is the purchase of the Core Knowledge Language Arts CKLA for grades five, K through five, sorry, Dr. Bills. All right, I'm back again. It doesn't look like I'm projecting, though, for some reason. I can, were, were you going to bring up the needs yep. analysis? I can do that otherwise. Well, I was, it's a presentation. There okay, we go. go. There, there we go. you go. All right. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to um, present this information item to you um, as a proposal to adopt um, Core Knowledge Language Arts. Um, so just a little historical perspective um, on the why and the recommendation for this. Um, we are up for a social studies adoption. Um, our, our social studies resources have expired. Um, and last year, um, I surveyed our elementary teachers to kind of get some perspective um, around what they wanted us to consider as we moved forward with um, an adoption, a potential adoption for social studies. Um, and, you know, teachers reported that, you know, there's not enough time to teach social studies in our current schedule. Um, time kind of becomes a barrier for them. Um, you know, a lot of teachers, especially in the, in the really younger grades, um, there is a lot of consistency in terms of, you know, the topics and kinds of things that are covered in social studies and in ELA. And so, you know, they're like, is there a, a way that we can integrate these two subjects together? Um, that would save us some time, right? Um, it would also save us a little bit of money. Um, and some teachers in the survey called out core knowledge language arts specifically as a program um, and asked if that was something that we could look at. Um, beyond this, as we think about um, just the progress that we've made in ELA, and then um, as well think about this from um, a, a standpoint of equity, um, it's another great consideration for us to make. Um, you know, we have done a lot in terms of English language arts instruction. Um, we haven't made many great strides um, in terms of um, students meeting or exceeding proficiency in our data. Um, and some of the most current reading research that's available is actually suggesting that our, our approach to teaching reading um, in terms of, of comprehension um, needs to shift away from an emphasis on skills and strategies and more of an emphasis on building knowledge and developing academic vocabulary. Um, as we think about this from an equity standpoint, many of our teachers express concern that social studies is not a protected content time in our schedule. Um, and so our students who are most at risk, our English language learners, our special education students, um, are oftentimes pulled during this time in their day to receive um, support in, in areas that they, they need, right? Um, but it, it keeps them away from getting access to content um, and knowledge that is going to ensure that they're successful in college, career, and in life, right? So um, another consideration for us to make in terms of this adoption. Um, so just a little bit about our process. Um, this August, we started piloting. Oh, I lost you. Um, <laughs> I don't know what happened. I'll just keep talking. Um, so 
Um, this August, we started piloting. Um, 11 of our 14 elementary schools were represented, um, and those included title and non-title schools. Um, the representatives or the pilot teachers um, who were involved also represented teachers from our ELA task force and our social studies task force. In January, um, our, the selection team um, came together. Uh, we were trained, they were trained um, on a materials evaluation rubric for ELA. And then um, we also came to consensus around how we were going to collect alignment data for our social studies standards um, to help inform that decision. And they collected all of that data in January. In February, we surveyed um, our all of our K-5 students, actually, we found a way to survey our K-2 students, which was really fun. Um, and we also surveyed the other teachers who piloted CKLA to get feedback from them. In February, we held two um, data review meetings where we combed through all of the data that we had um, collected, our evaluation data, our alignment data, survey data, and then um, student achievement data as well. So I'm just gonna share a little bit about why we selected CKLA and are making this recommendation to you. Um, so CKLA um, engages our students in grade level complex and literary texts um, and their academic vocabulary. It builds knowledge for our students within and across grade levels um, through content rich nonfiction. Um, this slide showcases some of the units that our K-5 students would have the opportunity to participate in um, teachers and parents, actually, um, have shared that their students love the text um, and the units that they're exposed to during reading. Students discuss the topics outside of reading um, all of the time, and they are generalizing their knowledge and vocabulary um, to other areas of their lives. Um, this graphic um, depicts how CKLA intentionally builds um, and is built to develop knowledge. Okay, so you can see within those grade levels and then the connections that it makes um, across K grade levels through um, a student's K-5 experience. In these um, units, our students are regularly reading, discussing, and writing around grade level complex texts. The questions and tasks within CKLA um, require students to ground um, their responses using evidence from the text that they are reading or listening to. Sometimes they're just listening to them. Um, the questions and tasks within CKLA are intentionally scaffolded um, to get all students to higher levels of thinking, reading, writing, and rigor. Um, in speaking with one teacher, she shared that all of her students were learning and that she felt like she was actually supporting and meeting the needs of all of the students in her classroom. Um, our task force collected um, alignment to our social studies um, standards with CKLA, and it is going to support us in implementing a strong integrated ELA and social studies block in grades K-3. Um, as I suspected a little bit in grades 4-5, um, there are a significant number of standards that CKLA um, will not address for us. However, um, our current schedule, curriculum guides, and open source materials are going to allow us to cover these standards, um, and we will still be able to guarantee that all of our students will have access to ELA and social studies instruction in their day. Um, our district's greatest asset is our culturally diverse student population. CKLA brings the cultures and identities of our diverse student population into the classroom. Um, their units and texts create a platform for our students to be able to share about their culture and traditions, um, creating an environment where our students feel like they are known, heard, connected, valued, and supported. The teachers who had the opportunity to pilot CKLA have expressed what a positive experience using this resource has been, primarily for their students. While the content is heavy and the topics are exceedingly complex, our teachers have been astonished at how our students have responded. Many have shared that how much their students have loved the content um, and they just can't wait to open up the next unit and see what their next reader is gonna be all about. Um, and the teachers have also expressed how they've enjoyed learning alongside their students. 
Um, our students overwhelmingly expressed that they want to continue learning about topics like those that are presented in CKLA. Um, they perceive that their knowledge and vocabulary have grown as a result of participating um, in this pilot. Um, these are just a handful, uh, literally, <laughs> of the, the many, many comments that I got from our 3-5 students um, who had the opportunity to participate in CKLA. Um, many students even thanked us for the opportunity um, to get to pilot um, and experience CKLA. Uh, so as I shared before, our adoption cycle for K-5 social studies has already expired, um, and ELA was set to expire next spring. Um, the adoption for CKLA would serve as a dual resource adoption um, for ELA and social studies. Um, it also includes materials for our English language learners as well. Um, I'm currently negotiating with Amplify around the adoption, um, and I have asked that the adoption include 13 professional development days, um, Amplify Reading, which is a computer-based um, intervention support. Um, I, I should say it's intervention and extension, right? So if I demonstrate that I'm performing on grade level, it'll extend learning for me. Um, amplify reading for one year, and then um, the cost of shipping and handling, which is a cost savings to our district of $181,834. Um, so as I shared, I'm, I'm, I'm working on those negotiations. Um, I also wanna share that we um, are working on a buyback plan um, for the wonders materials that we have um, adopted. Um, there is a company that would work with us to come get the materials and we would be on a buyback program so we'd be able to recuperate some of the costs um, from wonders as well. Um, so the purchase of this would not exceed $584,334 this school year um, with annual costs not to exceed $175,000 annually. And with that, I will open it up for questions. First of all, appreciate the fact that you tied it to the equity. That was very important. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Any questions? Dr. Brose. I suspect these are two areas that uh, aren't being covered, and that would be what happens to state history and what happens to American history. Um, so American history actually um, is, is built in across the entire student experience K-5. Um, like for example, our second grade students learn about the War of 1812. Um, fifth graders are gonna learn about the Reformation. I mean, there's just, there's constantly units that students are exposed to American history um, throughout the grade levels. Um, as far as state history, uh, um, we would use, we have some materials that we can continue to use and um, our curriculum guides and, and open source materials as well to continue to address those state history. Um, we, without getting too far in the weeds, our, our, our schedule is going to actually allow us in fourth and fifth grade to protect ELA and social studies um, for our fourth and fifth grade students, which is something we haven't done before. Um, so I just think that's huge for them to have that opportunity. Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. That was a very good report. Appreciate that. Absolutely. All right. So 6.5 is the purchase additional student consumables from my perspectives, which is three year up front, Dr. Bills as well. Yes, and this is the last time you have to hear from me tonight. <laughs> um, okay, so this proposal, um, you should have the needs analysis, but it is um, to purchase additional student work texts um, for 6-8 for um, ELA. Um, the initial adoption for my perspectives did not, um, it only included work texts for our students for the first three years. And so there weren't enough work texts for our students to carry us through the duration of our adoption. 
Um, these additional work texts are gonna support our teachers in meeting the shifts in ELA, um, where students need to be regularly engaged in grade level complex texts, reading, writing, discussing those grade level complex texts. Um, it's also gonna support our teachers in providing evidence-based strategies for scaffolding um, our students who struggle to read to grade level complex text instead of using um, strategies that um, you know, are not, are not evidence to accelerate um, the growth of our students who are reading below grade level. Um, it's gonna support our students um, by engaging them regularly in text. Um, there is actually some recent research that would suggest that students actually demonstrate higher levels of comprehension when they are able to um, work with a physical piece of text um, versus a, a digital text. And that um, is especially true for when students are working with content-rich nonfiction. Um, so this edition would carry us um, through um, our adoption cycle for 6-8 ELA, which is set to expire in June of 2024. Um, and the cost of these materials would not exceed $140,000. Do you guys have any questions about that? All right, anybody have any questions? And I also wanna appreciate how you fill out the needs analysis as well. It's very helpful. Thank you. All right, it doesn't look like there's any questions, so All appreciate right. it. Thank you, have a wonderful evening. Yep, you too. All right, 6.6 .6 is the annexation agreement, Mr. Harden. Well, good evening. Um, if you would go to page nine, please. Uh, these are two different uh, annexations that the city has recently done. On page nine, you'll see uh, an outline of the area that is covering the first agreement. Sorry. Oh, there you go. And so you can see it's highlighted there. I believe it's called the Brooklyn subdivision. So it's the diagonal lines, uh, I guess, just east of the trailer court off of Capitol Avenue is the best way to describe it. So. The areas that are light in color are already in the city limits. And so this area will be brought into the city limits. Currently, it's part of the Northwest schools. And with this annexation and this agreement, the valuation in the land will be now forever in the city of Grand Island and therefore Grand Island Public Schools. So this is the first, if you go then to the final page of the document, I believe page 19, you'll see the same kind of outline and it is the diagonal uh, property there, uh, south of Husker Highway and just east of the subdevelopment that's already there. Uh, so the subdevelopment is not part of this annexation, it's just that land that's highlighted in the diagonals there. And so it's farmland and the same exact story annexed by the city of Grand Island. And with this agreement, it will now be part of Grand Island Public Schools forevermore. Uh, so, uh, the, normally we do this over eight year payments, but these dollar amounts and these tracts of land are low enough that um, upon approval by the board a month from today or month, next month's meeting, we'll send those documents to be approved by Northwest. Once they sign off on them, we'll pay that payment in full to them and take care of that this fiscal year. So then that's just taken care of because they're de minimis payments basically. So with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Again, it would be forwarded to action uh, next month. Anybody have any questions? No, nope. all right, thank you very much. Uh, 6.7 is the authority to sell and purchase real estate for construction technology program, Mr. Harden. So uh, back in the day, uh, and I think the uh, board minutes from that uh, meeting uh, are posted there. Uh, that board gave me the authority on their behalf to purchase and sell uh, construction tech lots and houses. Uh, as you might imagine, when we list those houses and we get offers, uh, it's uh, just like if you've ever experienced that personally, it's a time bound situation. And uh, of course we wanna fill those out and respond. A lot of times they come in at Friday at five and they have 24 hour notice and you know all that kind of stuff. So. Obviously, with my departure, uh, you don't want that to just be hanging in the wind and have to have official board minutes and board meetings and that to approve these. And so the suggestion is that um, 
you go ahead and then switch that authorization over to Dr. Grover as superintendent of schools and then or her designee. So when the time comes, she can then uh, designate um, Ken. Uh, if you, between now and next month, want to just put Ken's name in there and put that onto him, uh, it would just be something you could certainly do. So the proposal in front of you is to just make it a superintendent duty or designee. Again, this is information this month, approval for action next month. And that's all and, I have. And so would it be beneficial to just put superintendent and their designee because then we wouldn't have to continually change it in the future? I, I, I think that's what I would do. There's no reason to put a, make it a, a name association as much as make it a position. Okay. And then the designee can quite literally be whoever she did. I mean, it's up to superintendent right. uh, as time goes on. Okay. So. That sounds good. Yep. Anybody else have any questions or comments? No? Nope. All right. Thank you. 6.8 is the Amer Marisco presentation. Did I say that right, Mr. Patch? Uh, Amerisco. Okay. I did not. Sorry about that. Uh, well, <laughs> I apologize. I've been, I've been calling it that for quite a while, but it's actually Amerisco. Um, just a little history. Um, we, this summer, we started uh, doing an um, analysis and survey of all of our buildings around the district, a mere 2.1 million square foot of buildings uh, kind of thing. Um, the purpose is to be able to document uh, all the different systems, mechanical, electrical, building conditions, exterior, all that stuff, and, and have that so that we have that data so that it, you know, we can use it, obviously, for project lists, but it also uh, allows us to have the ability to uh, um, let's say, you know, I get hit by a truck, my knowledge doesn't get lost. It's, it's documented. And so uh, we've been working with uh, my team, uh, my Buildings and Grounds team, since, like I said, this summer in Amoresco, getting all that put together. And so tonight um, I'm going to have the, those guys uh, do their needs analysis uh, slideshow for you. And I'm just going to turn it over to uh, Tim Detloff with uh, Amoresco at this point, and I'll let him take that, and then I'll, I can answer any questions uh, when we get done. Good evening. How are you? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. yes. All right. So let me let me go through this real quick in the interest of time. Um, a little bit of on the approach, uh, as was already said, one of the things we wanted to do was make sure we understood how all the buildings and building systems within the portfolio are aging. And one of the things we did is we built a life cycle model, which basically takes the age of the building, the size of the building, the number of floors and the type of use, whether it's elementary or high school. We then build a life cycle template, which is three things, which has the, the cost of each of the building components. It has how long these systems are going to last and basically what kind of system is it. So it's whether it's a boiler, a roof, a parking lot, um, anything that can depreciate would be included in that. We then went ahead and did some on-site assessments and we looked through the facilities and we uh, at our engineers and architects look at all the building elements that made up those facilities and ultimately created a large database, and it is a very large database, which has a lot of information in it that describes when each, of, each piece of equipment is due for repair or replacement, uh, school by school, and uh, ultimately it helps us establish some financial dashboards that uh, help us figure out what the next investments need to be going forward. So that's, that was the approach. One of the things that came out of it is we put in all the facilities we put in the square footage and this graphic basically says that there's buildings built in the 1920s. The large share is in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, uh, the, the yellow, orange, and red, and, and so on. And you kept building schools, you know, decades thereafter. And ultimately there's 82 facilities, 2.1 million square feet roughly. The average age of this portfolio is 41 years of age, uh, which makes sense since uh, stuff was built in the early 20s, all the way to the 50s and 60s and so on. Um, and I'll get into the financial metrics in a second. Uh, there is actually a good news story attached to all of this. And that's, that's I think, what's, what's interesting with all this. Um, what we did is we built a dashboard, as uh, was described. It, it looks at the, uh, uh, basically, each facility would have a picture or a pin. Uh, and we color code them green, yellow, red for uh, risk rating reviews. 
Uh, all the schools will be listed on the left-hand side. You can click on any one of these. You'll drill into it. You'll see pictures. You'll see all the different things that are associated with those systems. But we also identify across the top what we call financial dashboard, which basically helps us understand what we call our, our capital needs. So again, we're looking at capital investments here that, that are required. So in 2021 and so on each and every year for the next 30 years, we then accumulate that over time. What does that look like over the next 30 years? And then we put a risk rating curve against that. And I'll describe that in just a sec. So from a needs analysis perspective, uh, this, is a, this is a roll up of all schools uh, combined. Each school would have its own picture and they're all different. Uh, no two are the same, of course unless they're built exactly at the same time by the same contractor and so on, but uh, that never happens. So you have this age profile or, or this, this backlog as we refer to it, we call it a deferred backlog, we refer to it as a capital renewal backlog, uh, represents about $38.1 million. So at first glance, that, that looks like a lot of money and it is. Uh, so that's how much is required today to, to reinvest back in the facility to make them whole now that $38.1 million didn't happen overnight. So that happened over the course of the last 20 years of things just being deferred, deferred. And the colors basically suggest that, you know, there's a bunch of electrical things in blue. There's a series of building envelope shell, you know, roofing system, windows and doors in green and uh, uh, site work. So parking lots, curbing, hardscape, landscaping stuff in yellow and mechanical in orange and, and so on and so forth. So each system, all these different building systems age over time. And what we wanted to do was plot out when each of these systems are gonna come due over the next 30 years. But we also wanted to use practical life cycles. We did not wanna use theoretical numbers. We wanted practical life as an example. Uh, practical life would suggest that a boiler as an example might last 33 years. But according to industry standards, which are what they call ASHRAE mechanical standards, that system should be replaced in 22 years. Well, those standards are not correct. So what we did is we actually used proper standards. We used theoretical life standards or practical life standards, I should say. And uh, that helped us really understand when a piece of equipment is due. Otherwise the sky would look like it's falling and you'd have this massive spike in the first year and that's not reality. Um, so we took the same information. We took that same, uh, sorry, the same $38.1 million in the first year and we showed that on the graphic here and then accumulate, we accumulated that and kept it all in 2021 $20, dollars over the course of the next um, 30 years. And by the time you hit uh, 2050, there's about a $277 million worth of needs that kick in. And that's again, not surprising. It's something you see all the time. And the one thing I'll say is that that number on the right-hand side up here on this graph, and I'm an engineer, so one should never say 100%, but I'm gonna tell you that's 100% correct. I may be wrong when a piece of equipment fails or when a boiler or chiller or window needs to be replaced, but cumulatively speaking, over the 30 years, it will need to be replaced. So we have great confidence in that number, 277 uh, million over the next 30 years. So I just wanna put that out there. Um, the other thing we look at is, well, what, what, when am I, what's the risk for me? Can I defer some of this stuff going forward? And the answer is yes, you can. What we did is we then plotted out what we call a asset sustainability curve. And, and, and I'll describe that in a second, but basically it's saying that if 90% of your facility is running the way it's supposed to, uh, likely you will not compromise the quality of teaching and learning in that space. So the question we're trying to answer is will facilities hinder the ability to teach and learn? And if your this dotted red line was down below here, uh, I, I would be concerned below your backlog. But what it's saying is, you're within range from a risk tolerance perspective, but everything above that dotted red line, you will need to fund in order to ensure that quality of teaching and learning is not challenged or compromised. So one other metric we use, I'm throwing this quickly at you. One other metric that's used as the last one I'll, I'll, I'll refer to is called a facility condition index, an FCI. And all it is is a simple ratio that says, well, how much money do I need to put in to fix my facility divided by its replacement cost. So if I had a house valued at $300,000 and I bought it brand new, I'd have zero over 300. I'd be sitting in the good range here at 0%. If I had $15,000 worth of repairs to do on my $300,000 house, I'd be on the edge of the you know, fair range and I'd be at 5% FCI and so on. If I'm $30,000 worth of repairs to do and I don't have the funds to fix it on my $300,000 house, I'm at a 10% ratio, I'm sitting in the fair range and so on. 
What you don't want is a facility to be sitting in this 30% range. So imagine your house, you had $90,000 for repairs to do on your house, on a $300,000 house, and I did not have the funds to fix it. I probably would sell my house. Well, we're not gonna sell our schools, um, but that, that's, that's not the plan. The plan is that, that you keep reinvesting and, and you maintain them. So the in industry standard basically is the sustainability target that says, I'd like all my schools to be in the green range or the yellow range going forward. And if they hit the poor range today or in the future, that's concerning. And then I need to figure out well, what, what kind of investment do I need to put in? This database that we have will tell you exactly which systems, which, which uh, building systems you have are aging and which ones need attention and by when, so based on a risk profile. So it's a massive database with a lot of information in it. Now, if I plot all this out, just to orient you around the graph, the green is, is again the good range, the yellow band is fair range, orange is, is poor, red is critical. And today I'm actually sitting at an FCI of 6.7%. So for your portfolio, and I can tell you I've done hundreds and hundreds of these, uh, and I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of boards like this, uh, this is a very good picture. You should be very proud of, of where you're at. So the investments that you put into your facilities as a whole uh, is, is tremendous, it's really worked well. You're sitting at 6.7%, that's exactly where I wanna be. But by the time you hit 2023, you're starting to just get to the crest of that uh, poor range. And then as I move on in time, 2039, I'm gonna hit a critical state, which is not where you want to be at all. So what it means is that I need to figure out what kind of funding I need to make sure that I stay at that yellow 10% line that I'm at right now, I'm at 6.7. Uh, which is tremendous. I, I'll tell you, some districts are sitting already at 20, 24% starting today. Uh, you're in a very, very good position. So you've done a great job. So this is again, without any funding. But what I wanna figure out is, well, how much money do I need to achieve, get to this dotted red line uh, going forward, that 10% FCI line. And uh, what I need is 7.3 million every year or $220 million in today's dollars. No escalation, no inflation on that. but. So, so that's, that's kind of the, uh, uh, the story around this. So again, the sky is not falling today, but you now have an opportunity to try and figure out, well, how do I now fill in the rest of that gap for the schools that I have in my portfolio? And what I can tell you with 100% accuracy is that you will need 7.3 million every single year or you know, massive fusion of $220 million over the course of 30 years. Then what we did last slide is we actually broke down each school. We showed where they're at from a school by school perspective. Uh, and on the right hand side, the color co uh, coding here is that year one, we, we show which schools are in the green range today, which ones are in the yellow range, which ones are in the poor range, which ones are in critical range. And then each year, year five, 10, 15, 20, you can see there's a bit of a migration that takes place. And uh, again, you're, you're in very good shape overall today. 6.6, uh, 6.7% 6 6 FCI, but within five years, you're moving to 13. So again, the sky isn't falling, but it, it does require an investment uh, to make sure that the quality of teaching and learning is not challenged and compromised or hindered by facilities. Uh, I will stop there. I, I went very quickly. I was told I had very short time. Yeah. I went through it quick enough to uh, absolutely confuse you. That was a great job there, Tim. Um, you know, so questions? Uh, questions from the group. Mr. Helensky. It looks like, according to your graph there, Tim, it's going to double within the next five years. Is that correct as far as the FCI? Uh, so, sorry, say that again. I'm sorry. Is it going to, is it, uh, according to that graph there, it's going to be, your FCI is going to double within the next five years for the buildings, correct? Altogether? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Yep. Assuming that uh, it depends on the amount of funding you put in. So, the more funding you put in each year, obviously that'll impact the FCI greatly. So what we needed to figure out, even in this previous graph, was, you know, for the next couple of years, I'm, I'm okay. And this is a great graph to see it all on. Um, and by the time you hit 2023, you are going to have to consider some, some investments, but I, I would obviously consider the investments now to try and avert the problem for the future. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, doesn't look like it. Great, well, thank you. 
Thanks again, Tim, for your time tonight. Um, uh, this, this is, really helps us, uh, you know, make plans as we move forward for, with the annual project list. Um, I think. And I'm assuming, will this be part of the master facility planning meetings that we'll be having? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So. This is a this is a tool for us uh, to actually bring uh, data. Um, that's you know we went to a lot of work to to gather mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, it kind of gives you the big picture. Um, unfortunately, uh, Virgil's not going to loan us his magic money tree to fund it right now. <laughs> but um, th we'll just continue the work uh, as as we have uh, annually. And uh, uh, thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Have a good night. Yes. Okay, 6.9 is the endpoint management solution, Mr. Gerhardt. Good evening. Um, i got a handful of things I'm gonna go through tonight. The first of which is uh, a Manage Engine Desktop Central. This is a product um, if you recall back when I actually first got here about nine years ago, we needed a tool to help manage our endpoints and our mobile devices. We um, went to the market and found a product that suited our needs called Absolute Manage at that time. And one of the challenges we faced is as with any good software company, they like to change hands multiple times over the years. And so um, the, the culmination is, is this um, here before you tonight. We, uh, um, they've, they've gone through four different companies and it's finally gotten to the point where the product, I mean, I, I have nothing bad to say about the product, but it's, it's really designed for an enterprise that's, that's even much larger than ours. And so the, uh, uh, the investment you need in human capital to, to run it effectively um, became unmanageable. And so we went back to the table and said, how can we better leverage the folks that we have in our organization um, to get the job done when it comes to our endpoints. And then um, it also addresses some challenges that we've had over the last, um, the last year with um, a mobile and remote workforce, um, being able to effectively manage and maintain equipment when it isn't necessarily on our premises. Um, so this tool does provide for that as well. This does uh, uh, something that we, we currently don't have today and that's third-party patch management. So when you get your Adobe and Java and all of the other notifications that need um, Firefox and et cetera, if they don't auto update, we can, we can force and, um, that to happen and keep our, our devices and endpoints more secure. Um, so I guess that's kind of a summary. This is an information uh, item this evening, you know, uh, and we'll bring it back next month and, and for action. Are there any questions? Move on to 6.10, which is the GIPS copier and print services RFP. Okay, um, a parting gift from Mr. Harden to me um, was the opportunity to uh, do an RFP for GIPS for copy and print, managed copy and print services. Um, so back in November, we started the conversation about what um, this would look like. Um, I reached out to my colleagues, got a a number of responses from them regarding RFP tools to use. We worked through um, that process with um, internally as well as, you know, I met with principals regarding their current status of the copiers and, and printers that they're using um, throughout the month of December and into the first part of January. And then we went out for proposals on January 17th. Um, initially we had seven companies that responded um, to an inquiry asking for more information. So we provided the RFP to them. We provided them access to a frequently asked questions document and uh, solicited feedback and questions from them um, throughout the month of, of uh, the end of January and the first part of February. Um, went through, answered those questions. Um, proposals were due on March 1 um, and we interviewed um, pers perspective bidders at that point. We, uh, out of the seven that initially inquired, we, we had three respondents. And, uh, and so we uh, have a, a tally of those responses here on the last page of the PDF that's attached. 
Um, the three bids received were Canon Solutions of America, that's uh, the Canon corporate. We had um, Capital Business Systems, and we had EX Office Solution. So um, part of that, the process, of course, of any RFP is determining you know, bidder responsibility, whether we have a responsive bidder or not. Um, we did our due diligence. Um, we had a couple of meetings the first week of March with the Facilities and Finance Committee. And um, I reached out to references for the bidders and uh, shared results across the bidders and did some follow-up and clarification and, and just bid review with everyone. In fact, we had phone calls pretty much every day, including today, um, regarding the, the bids and the responses. It's, it's worth noting, um, if you get to the table at the end, there's the Canon Solutions of America the response didn't quite materially meet the, the requirements of the RFP, so at that point they were deemed to be a non-responsible bidder. Um, didn't include some of the software that was required um, in the response, and the, you know obviously you can see the, the pricing there is what it is. It also, um, I did explicitly reject the notion of having a, a, a base rate and then overages of click charges. So basically you walked into it and you're gonna pay a base flat fee every month and then if you use more than that, you pay more. But if you use less, you don't pay any less. And that was just something that, that wasn't acceptable to the process. Um, so then um, obviously we were left with the two, Capital Business Systems, EX Office Solutions. You can see um, the responses, the click charges. And so the way this works is they proposed a cash price for all the equipment. They also proposed a lease price so that we can have payments. We can choose to lease through the organization or we can choose to lease that um, independently. Um, at this point, it's nice to have um, one party representing all of it. Um, so I guess as we go through the recommendation, I'd probably recommend with the rates the way they are, I don't think we would be in a substantially better place if we went out and sought rates on our own. Um, for this particular uh, project. Um, but you can see the, the capital response, um, the black and white, the color, and the laser charges. Um, they're fairly close. Uh, you see that the color is just a little bit higher than on EEK's response, but EEK's black and white is, you know, I, how many ten thousandths of a, half a ten thousandth of a cent different? We're, um, but it adds up, I mean, when you look at it. In order to do the comparison, um, I picked a year that was not like this one <laughs> and, uh, and used that as the average by which we measured and then did the multiplication to figure out what five years would look like like that. Now, that's also understanding that the volumes change and, and you know, to be fair, the color volumes have been increasing um, at, at the rate at which they're increasing. Um, I, I didn't, because of the situation that we've been in the last year and the way that we were measuring it, um, I didn't want to project anything into this because I didn't think it would have been a fair assessment. So we did evaluate that. Um, black and white has been falling a little bit. Um, but that's the, uh, the process that we went through. Um, you can see that capital came in as the low bidder at $978,521 for a five-year agreement. Um, and that's why the recommendation of the Facilities and Finance Committee, as well as myself, is that we begin negotiations with capital to enter into an agreement that will be finalized and approved at the April board meeting. So that's how we went. Um, I did invite uh, Mr. Jeremy Reimers this evening to do a quick introduction. He's with uh, Capital Business Systems, and I thought it might be uh, good just to hear a few words out of, from him. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Jeremy Reimers, Regional Sales Manager with Capital Business Systems, and I, I will say I've worked with a lot of school districts in the past, but Corey and his team has... Um, probably been the most thorough <laughs> he uh, he did a good job and uh, really vetted um, vetted well 
but I do uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with Grand Island Public Schools. And um, is there any questions of me? Mr. Hulinski. Where, where are you based out of? I'm sorry. Right here in Grand Island. Right here? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we've been in Grand Island. Uh, we've had sales and service teams in Grand Island for um, about 15, 20 years. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I just have one question. So looking at this on the e-gold facts, there's 500 pages and then on the one for eeks it's 4,000. I just wanted to make sure, yep. is that correct? It, it is correct. So um, what I did there, because I didn't specify page volumes in the RFP, so um, what I got were different levels of the monthly charge for that. So I actually used the 4,000 page um, per month, which is kind of the average of where we're at, that EX had proposed as the dollar figure for that amount, and that was uh, designated in, in note two there. Okay. And I will say, you know, Jeremy and his team did a pretty good job of, of responding to this in a fairly creative way. One of the things that they're proposing is simplifying the equipment even more. And so we, we were able to do that over the years um, when we were working with EECS to get down to a, just a handful of, of units. And this takes it even one step further and, and kind of merges. Instead of having color units and monochrome units, we can, we'll have one unit that is a, a color unit, but we can disable that color functionality um, for the units that we don't want to to control our printing costs and our color prints, as well as use the software, um, that paper cut software to drive those things into um, the monochrome print. Uh, but what that flexibility gives us is the ability to take those units, if we have something that's being overutilized in a location, we can swap those out um, in year one, year two, year three, as we do these periodic reviews. So we'll be meeting, um, well, we'll have to figure that out based on the agreement, but uh, biannually probably, or I guess I should say twice a year, to, uh, to discuss what the usage is on the equipment and how we can move that around to reduce downtime and, and uh, increase productivity. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Facility and finance team, anything you want to share? Nope. Okay. All We've right. Very good. Thank you. Oh, oh. sorry. Mrs. Ms. Wolf. <laughs> sorry. I just thought of something. I was processing. Um, do we have um, multifunction printing right now? Yes. And this would have multi-function printing as well, so they could print from building to building. Okay, mm -hmm. correct. Thank you. And it will actually, there's some improvements we're going to make to the print center um, that will help drive more of the load into the production print process and reduce um, the how onerous it is on the teacher and on the on the user right now by making that easier for them to do that and just have those those copies in their mailbox so that um, so that we can leverage the, the higher production equipment there. Okay. All right. And All thank right. you very much for being here tonight. We appreciate you sitting through the meeting. Oh, thank <laughs> so. yes, thank I you. learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Thanks. All right. Thank you. We will move to agenda item 6.11, which is the student handbook for 2021-2022, Dr. Dexter. It's that time of year again. So um, our team met just via email and um, uh, just really have some basic um, cleanup and then had some additions. So I'll just go through the, the updates and it, they reference page numbers. So if you want to go look at the student handbook, you can do so. Um, just the, you know, we had to add the board policy on Title IX and um, just some little cleanup language on that. And then um, we added the equity statement. So that will be added to the student handbook. Uh, and then we still had some language on CNSSP, so deleted that. Then grading, um, just cleaned up the language um, there based on academic achievement, not behavior is really key. Um, Conduct resulting in suspension, expulsion, or reassignment. We just needed to um, make sure that policy was linked. Um, fix the heading on district wellness policy. And then on page 34, electronic device voluntary protection plan. And um, 
uh, Corey just updated some language so that we included virtual school. Um, we had it in the plan five through 12, but we have some elementary kids that are taking their devices home. So um, they can also apply for that protection plan. Page 34, we just had some redundancy, so we deleted the, the safety language there. And then on page 38, um, this is the uh, within five days of suspension notice. Um, it can go to the superintendent or designee. And it, at this point, it usually comes to me first. Then uh, page 38, board policy, participation, and activities guidelines. And um, we worked for a, a full year on just making these more understandable, a little bit flexible, but still spelling out the consequences. We also involved area school um, activity directors and principals. And um, if you see the first violation, second violation, um, and third violations were the, the major changes in that policy. And then the student self-report, that was redundancy, so we deleted that language. And then on page 43, supply lists, and um, our principals have been great about really narrowing that down um, so that parents aren't expected to um, purchase a lot of stuff right before school starts. So um, they've been really good about budgeting and making sure they have supplies that all kids can use. And then we also changed um, uh, on the, we have to get specific on what we expect students to purchase to be able to participate. And um, so just cleaned up the language on band and orchestra. So those were the changes to the handbook. And uh, any questions? Any questions? Thank you for doing that work. We appreciate it. All right, 6.12 is the GIPS Foundation added up to opportunity staff and board campaign, Mrs. Skullberg. Okay, well, thank you very much for allowing me to address you this evening. Um, I came here tonight to give you uh, a little bit of an update of the work of the Grand Island Public Schools Foundation and then uh, also introduce the 2021 added up to opportunity staff and board campaigns. Um, the foundation recently worked with Match Nonprofit Consulting to develop a strategic framework laying out our plans for the next three years. And the process involved a lot of stakeholders with over 600 answering surveys regarding our work. Uh, many other district and foundation stakeholders worked in teams uh, to further define and inform this process. So I shared an executive summary um, and recommendations from Match Nonprofit Consulting Team with this board last month in the board reports. So I hope you had an opportunity to read through that. Um, one of the things that the team pointed out was our need to codify our relationship with the school district and the Board of Education. So we indeed provide valuable services to one another. Um, it's a mutually beneficial success equation. Um, and the consulting team really drove home that point that we should have a formal memorandum of understanding. So um, I put a couple flyers at each of your spots um, that give some quick stats about the work of the Grand Public Schools Foundation last year. And I wanna draw your attention to the financial stats page that looks like this. Um, just to note that it's hard work to both collect and give away money. Um, your foundation has built a staff who gives tirelessly and understands that we operate in a glass house. We are determined to do all we can in a credible manner with solid processes. But obviously the best number on this financial page is the $2,319,636 that were invested in programs, scholarships, and grants benefiting students last year. Um, you can see, though, just by this sheet alone, the accounting alone, it is to our mutual benefit. Um, in addition to 10,000 gifts processed last year, the foundation handled more than 2,600 transactions for booster and parent organizations. So we work very closely with the Grand Island Public Schools Business Office, supporting multiple functions of the organization. So we're gonna be working on a formal MOU uh, to bring to you for your consideration in the coming months. We're intertwined on so many levels and that has taken some time to think through it, unpack it and codify it, um, but we're up to the job. So more to come on that. I just wanted to kind of give you an overall view of why we would go there. <laughs> um, 
So now switching gears to the staff and board campaign. Um, this year, our theme is extraordinary opportunities in our extraordinary times. Um, 2021, or 2020 and 2021 have been indeed extraordinary. Um, in 2020, we were getting ready to kick this campaign off when the school buildings closed. So we pivoted and we moved it to an online campaign, um, still reaching a significant amount of staff and raising more dollars than the year prior. We also crossed an important milestone. The GIPS staff have now given more than $1 million to this effort since we began the campaign in 2004. That's pretty darn significant. Um, 2020 also saw us hit another important milestone. Uh, we were, again, we were just getting ready to start awarding scholarships at this time last year, and we went ahead and finished that process in a virtual environment. Uh, we're happy we did. We crossed the $6 million mark in giving scholarships away from the inception of the foundation. And so um, that was another big, a big 2020 thing for us. Um, so I must admit, um, this job obviously produces a lot of powerful moments, uh, lots of happy tears, fairy godmother opportunities, some sad tears too, um, but it all boils down to our donors. And we do have incredible donors who stepped up, ready to give extraordinary opportunities and also to our new emergency fund. They're the ones who see what is possible and they invest in it. So if you were sitting around this horseshoe 17 years ago, and I don't know if any of you were, um, a few were, a few were. Um, <laughs> um, well, and, and Dr. Brose probably was too. Um, Sitting around here 17 years ago, you would have never dreamed that your foundation was capable of investing over $28 million into students. And you would have been right. 17 years ago, we were not capable of that. But we are capable now. And with the solid footing of our district partnership and support, um, this has been coupled with community trust, long-term relationships, and a little bit of grace that has defined our path to significant investment in students. So with this and all the other things that have been noted on the flyers in front of you, that leads me into culture, which is why I came here tonight. Um, the foundation's ability to invest in our students boils down to internal support from teachers, staff, administration, and board members. This has been, continues to be, a very significant testimony for our organization. And the numbers show that stakeholder investment by staff and board members snowballs into investment by outside donors. So for many years, the GIPS staff and boards have given at a consistent 90% or above participation rate for staff and 100% participation rate for the Board of Education and the Foundation Board. So this year's campaign, Extraordinary Times, Extraordinary Opportunities, um, supports programs like classroom grants, scholarships, special opportunities for individual students, and we launch it, we launch the campaign on March 23rd and it will run through April 16th. The challenge gift this year comes from the Sam Foltz Foundation. And um, Gerald and Jill Foltz have had a long and enduring commitment to the Grand Island Public Schools, where as you know, Jill served as school nurse for the district for 34 years. Um, three of their four children graduated from Grand Island Senior High. And Gerald and Jill were involved parents and passionate sports fans. Um, Jill said, this is their year. Um, they really wanted to uh, do something this year. They noted the extraordinary circumstances, and she said, we just have a sincere desire to encourage the staff and the students of Grand Island Public Schools to dream big in all of their endeavors. So they pledged $5,027 from the Sam Fultz Foundation to match qualifying gifts to the campaign. So you know I can't come here without soliciting you. That's of course what I do. That's what they pay me to do, right? Um, so we'll be sending our materials out to you in the mail. Um, the foundation will again be participating in the Grand Island Giving Day Go Big Give. So if you choose to use that mechanism, there will be instructions in your packets on how to do that. Um, you so far have seen uh, the brochure, which is hot off the press, came to our office today. Um, you uh, do not have a pledge card yet, so you will get one of those in the mail and it will tell you how, um, how to give and what mechanisms you can use to do so. Um, 
I do want to thank you for your past support, and I want to ask you to help us continue this incredible culture of giving. Think about why you give, and I invite you to continue to invest in students with us. And I want to leave you with a testimony from uh, Jen Kramer. She's a teacher at Westridge Middle School and one of our co-chairs this year. She said, now more than ever, donations are important. Through many grants, scholarships, and the COVID emergency fund, students are impacted every day. The GIPS Foundation continues to pro provide assistance to those in need throughout the district. I feel a sense of pride knowing my money is going to help students and teachers across the district. Any questions? Do we have any questions? It doesn't look like it. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time tonight. Yeah, thank you. All right. We have a little bit of time, so we're going to skip 6.13 and go to 6.14 construction update. Mr. Patch. Oh, I'll keep it brief. Um, ELC has been coming along pretty well. Uh, the, uh, the only things that have come up recently is COVID's real in its ugly head again and, and gonna probably cause us some consternation with uh, kitchen equipment deliveries and also some flooring. But uh, at this second time, uh, I say we're still on schedule. Um, they've started doing some finishes, you know, still doing the um, drywall finishing, started painting, uh, starting ceilings, and then obviously working on just everything that happens on the mechanical, electrical, plumbing side of things. It's, so, um, and hopefully here uh, a week from Friday, 10 o'clock, we're gonna do a tour uh, and hope that uh, most of you guys can, can make that and you can kind of see our progress and see the space. It's, it's really awesome. Um, we should do a pre-tour and, and go up to the old ELC and then go down to this one because uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable. I'm really looking forward to this project. Uh, it's going to be great for the, our um, preschoolers and, and staff. So with that, I'll conclude, and I'll answer any questions you might have. I don't think we need, need any reminders of the old spot, but thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody questions? It doesn't look like it. Thank you. You can leave. Sorry. <laughs> 6.15 is our student representative report, Mr. Bartling. Thank you, and I'm confident that I'll be able to squeeze this in by 7.30, so <laughs> we'll, we'll be good. Um, so, of course, it's March, um, and that means winter sports have concluded. Um, Islanders did show up pretty strong. Um, boys basketball went 12-11 and 11 this season, and we brought back two state champs in wrestling, Brody Aarons and Blake Cushing, which is really, really good to see. Um, spring sports uh, have started already. Um, track, for instance, has started already practicing on our track. And overall, we've had an increase in the number of participants this year compared to past years, which is a neat fact. Um, and GISH will host the Class A2 district tract uh, competition on May 12th at Memorial Stadium and the NSAA district boys golf at, uh, on May 17th at Riverside Golf Course. Um, moving on to activities, uh, show choir finished off its competitive season following a good showing at Lewis Central last Saturday, no, two Saturdays ago. Um, placing fourth overall. And then the band program held a jazz concert on March 2nd, where all the different ensembles, including our mariachi band, the concert, and symphonic ensembles, wind ensemble, and our jazz bands performed their spring pieces. Um, and it's an event like these that really make me and a lot of my peers appreciate how far we've come in the past few months, being able to do stuff like this compared to sitting on a stage and recording in front of an empty audience. So it's, <laughs> it's great. Um, NHS will be inducting its members for the class of 2021 on March 17th, this Wednesday, 364 days after originally anticipated, but I mean, we're still glad to do it, just a little bit of a pushback. And then all of the choral ensembles will be performing um, later this month uh, in just a sort of standard concert. The date did get postponed after I wrote this report, so. Um, and then I have a little bit of a neat story. So. Three years ago, I organized a voter registration drive with the assistance of the election commissioner and Mr. Gilbertson at the high school. We registered about 20 students over the course of the lunch period, and I continued to organize these events as time went on. The timeline for organizing an event prior to the 2020 election was too tight to organize, so Mr. Gilbertson and I sort of started working on a way to hold a drive after the election was over. As it happens, a new pool of eligible voters opened up at the start of the semester. Those who will be 18 by November 2nd are now eligible to register to vote. 
Despite all of this, we had one big question. How will it work? Um, we cannot realistically, with our current protocols, have registrars enter the building for the purpose of registering voters only. So um, we're still continuing our protocols and policies on visitors, so that was not going to happen. So we did what Islanders do. We stepped up to the plate. Two of my fellow classmates, one of my teachers, and I received the necessary training to become certified deputy registrars in the state of Nebraska, and we held the drive on March 1st completely by ourselves. I'm proud to say that we shattered a county record and registered 34 students over the course of an hour and 15 minutes. This was published in the Independent and on NTV News, and as a result, several other community schools have started talking about this. And as it happens, I will be registering students over at Grand Island Central Catholic tomorrow, pursuant to all safety guidelines put out by the CDC. So it's really, really great to hear. And then lastly, it's sort of a reflective thing because today is actually one year. One year ago today, I was sitting down in my basement and I get a call for Kendall to come upstairs because school was no longer happening tomorrow. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to say that that's a year. Uh, 365 days ago, the school district made a call to prioritize student, staff, and safety, community safety um, that spelled a major impact to the lives, realities, and mental health of everybody with any sort of ties to this district or the schools it oversees. It's hard to say a whole year has passed, like I said, but it's uh, important to recognize that Islanders did some pretty grown-up stuff and stepped up to the plate as well. And I have a couple of examples that I did organize so that we can kind of look back and see what good we've done. Um, in March of 2020, two days after school was canceled, um, a Gish Jr., now a graduate, Eliza Garza, organized a food drive for families who could not locate food. If you recall in those first days, um, it was very, very hard to find food on the shelves. So it's really, really great to see people actually being able to grab that food. In April, May, July, October, and November of 2020, a group of 10 or so GISH students became election workers and poll workers to keep poll workers at home that are at risk and to help ensure that the election process went through however different it may be. Um, throughout the past year, um, GISH students at varying paces and times have completed CNA certification and have entered the medical field in and around Grand Island helping to combat COVID-19 in our city, county, state, and country as a whole. In October of 2020, Gish senior Maya Brown organized a Running for Relief virtual 5K and mile run that supported the Gips Foundation's COVID-19 emergency fund. In November of 2020, NHS, the National Honor Society at Gish, organized a blood thrive, drive through the Red Cross at essentially a time when the Red Cross was facing a drought. They didn't have enough blood and donors to um, continue their services. In December of 2020, NHS actually organized and decorated masks to community members who were in need of face coverings. And in February of 2021, um, 92 cans of food were donated by both FBLA and FCCLA after a can drive at the school to uh, Hope Harbor and other community organizations that work with that. Um, we've made this year happen. We've stuck together and we've made it through the past 365 days and I think that's something to be proud of. With that, I will field any questions that you all may have. Thank you. That was a very good report and good to remember everything that's happened because it feels like five years, not one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, do you want us to take a break now and then do your report after? No, or do you, just go ahead and do my report. Yep, if you think you can get her done. Yep. Oh, I'm watching the clock. Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, Kendall, thank you so much uh, for your report. That was uh, very well done and a lot of leadership. And um, I just want to maybe, can we just give a round of applause for Mr. Giberson, the high school, for their leadership and the way that our <laughs> kids are really uh, leading. I very much appreciate that. And so that kind of takes care of my first agenda item, too, <laughs> was actually just to thank the board uh, for leading and guiding us, as well as supporting and trusting us. We know that this has definitely been a trying time. Uh, but together, we continue to uh, do what's right for our students and for our community. Uh, so thank you all so much for that. I especially uh, want to thank our pandemic team um, because, I mean, boy, do we have some tough conversations, um, but always thinking about student safety um, and how we continue to make sure that learning is a priority for our students and most recently demonstrated by the vaccine um, effort. And so today, um, I think we're up to 99% of our folks have received the vaccine, uh, only about 14 people left, and that's only because of their own personal uh, conflicts of scheduling and so forth. So um, they, they can do that. 
uh, as Corey kind of announced today, we are out of the vaccine business. So any future vaccines, they can get them over at Fauna Park, uh, which uh, several of us have been over there. So it's a very easy process. And so kudos to CDHD um, and their team as well. And I do want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Lee Jacobson and uh, Mr. Corey Gearhart for their efforts. They have been tracking um, who's been receiving the vaccine, getting all the information out, being on site. Um, and it's just uh, just kudos to our team, just a lot of great effort uh, to make things run. I thought that was very telling what the gentleman said earlier about Corey and his team very, being very thorough. <laughs> I think that is the Grand Island Public Schools way. Some people say we're controlling, but we're just thorough. <laughs> Um, I also want to give a special shout out to uh, one of our students, um, Ian Thompson. I don't know if you heard about this, but he's a second grader over at Dodge Elementary who was highlighted uh, here tonight. Uh, today he received a power wheelchair, uh, which he has been working to get for years. So after two years of work, uh, physical therapist uh, Jenny Rother was able to acquire the funds necessary for Ian to receive this wheelchair. And I hear that it's very special, had to be special order, and so it was delivered to him today. Uh, his family was on hand for the event. Some media was there, and he was so excited. This is kind of funny. I wasn't there, but people told me about it. Um, he was so excited to drive the wheelchair. He actually ran into his dad during the, um, <laughs> during the media interview. So I don't know if they would show that on the news, but he's getting used to that wheelchair already. So uh, shout out to Ian. We're so proud of you. Uh, Jennifer Worthington and I, we will be presenting at Noon Rotary tomorrow. We'll be sharing excerpts from the annual report um, so that we can keep the community informed. Um, I will also be taking part later this week um, in an event or a series through NET. Don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called Nebraska Stories. Mm -hmm. um, it's a TV production, um, and so they want to cover how we have responded to uh, the pandemic. So I'm sure I have a lot to say about GIPS uh, during that time. But this will also give me an opportunity to go over to Shoemaker uh, to their little media uh, setup to see their eager eyes, news, and action. I asked them if it was okay for humble little Dr. Grover to come over and bar their studio. Uh, so they, I'm excited to see them in action as well. And just for, um, as a point of privilege, uh, I do want to acknowledge Mr. Harden. I know we had an opportunity to celebrate him uh, earlier today, and today was uh, supposed to officially be his last day. And I think Mr. Harden told me, do I have this right, that he has attended 650 board meetings? Wow. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. <laughs> For all of, yes, yes. I know I've only had a chance to work with him for just a short period of time, but I tell everybody everywhere I go, he is the real deal CFO, and I'm just not ready to let him go either. So he has agreed to stay on as a little part-time worker for us uh, <laughs> all the way to, uh, through July. So he's going to help transition um, the new CFO. And I know that, um, you know, that's a huge responsibility because we already know that he has some other uh, job responsibilities, but he loves and cares for GIPS so much that he's willing to do that. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Harden. Um, do you want to say anything? Yeah, come on up and say a couple of words. I yield the floor to you. Uh, you know, it's hard to imagine anybody getting luckier than me in my career and working as a school business official. Uh, a couple different states, three or four different school districts, but uh, one, of the, one of the best things that I can take away from my time is just the, the pride in being able to tell the story that over the time, uh, with GIPS specifically, uh, the community has sent the highest quality of person to be on the school board, and people that really truly care and love children and who always make those decisions uh, with the children at the forefront. And so to be part of that for 21 plus years uh, is really just my darn good luck. And so um, I will be around uh, taking care of duties as I need to, uh, as limited basis as I can, <laughs> kind of like, uh, but uh, certainly with enough to get what needs to be done done. And uh, I did have a chance to meet Ken. Uh, we spent four hours plus together for Saturday. Uh, and so the good, super good news is I have full faith and confidence in his ability to take the reins and run. So thank you. Thank you. 
So, and yes, you've left this place a much better place or position, I guess I should say, as than it was when you first got here. So thank you very, very much. And just to, to add on to what Dr. Grover said about the year of this pandemic is um, thank you for your leadership and putting together all the pieces so that we could move forward. I am, I know I'm personally grateful and I, I'm sure the rest of the board members are that we have been in school since August and when a lot of schools couldn't make that happen and, and still haven't, <laughs> yes. The, I mean, when I hear stories about schools still trying to figure out how to open, I am incredibly grateful. I cannot imagine where our children would be if this had not had happened. And, it, and so thank you to the teachers uh, for being willing to continue teaching in person. And um, it's just been extraordinary, very humbling to watch all of you in your leadership positions. So thank you for making it happen. All right, I'm gonna suggest that we take a break and um, before we move into action items because at 7.30 we'll, we will join that presentation from NASB. So feel free to please be back by 
Okay, I've got 7.30 on my phone. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. It's good to see some of you uh, at your board meetings tonight. Uh, it's, it's not ideal. We'd love to be there in person, but uh, this will do. And uh, we're looking forward to getting back out on the road and, and seeing a lot of you uh, across the state of Nebraska over the next year. And uh, hopefully things get start getting back to normal a little bit. So uh, my name is John Spots. I'm the executive director with the Nebraska Association of School Boards. And I really appreciate you uh, joining us tonight. We are working right now in partnership with the Nebraska Department of Education and we're very pleased that the NDE is engaging school board members in a brief overview of the proposed changes to Rule 10. And you might wonder why is this important to you? Uh, well, Rule 10 deals with the annual accreditation of your school district. So it's a very important area and they are going from, through some changes right now and we're very pleased that they're engaging school boards on those proposed changes. So we've been doing this all month in March. Uh, we've been able to uh, be, participate in a number of school board meetings all across the state throughout the month. And at the end of this week, our NASB board leadership staff will seek your feedback on behalf of NDE. So you will be getting a, a, an email link to a survey that's going to enable you to provide feedback on some of the changes uh, that they're proposing in Rule 10. And if you have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to contact me or anyone at the association. We'd be thrilled to help you. So. We do have a, a very brief presentation, and tonight we have Don Lowski, who's a Director of Accreditation with the Nebraska Department of Education. So Don, I'm gonna turn it over to you, and again, thank you very much for this partnership. We've enjoyed getting to know some of the folks over there uh, in the Accreditation Department, and uh, thanks for doing this tonight. Thank you, John. Uh, well, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to do this also. We at NDE greatly appreciate uh, NASB's uh, opportunity for us to to meet with all of the school boards across the state, our uh, public school districts, as they are having meetings and their monthly board meetings. And I just wanna share a little personal note, something different for me is that in November, I was elected to the Nebraska City Public Schools Board. And so I've had three meetings now under my belt starting in January. And I've been in education a long time and many of you know me and I've worked with many of you that are on, on this, uh, webinar tonight and uh, but it's certainly different being a board member so I really thank you for taking the time to listen to the changes and updates that we're making to rule 10 and rule 14 so again thank you John for doing that for us um, we're going to talk about approval accreditation and accountability and you're going to hear me say those three words and we refer to them a lot of times as the three A's uh, but when you hear the word approval, I want you to think about um, minimal standards. Similar to what's in Rule 10 and Rule 14 for our non-public schools is Rule 10 is minimal standards of operation of a school. And so keep that in mind when you hear about approval and as I talk about approval. The next one is the accreditation and accreditation is, is based on continuous improvement. For many years, we have really been trying to emphasize the, the importance of, of continuous improvement with our schools that you really cannot make any progress unless you have a solid or sound accreditation. Uh, continuous improvement process. So keep that in mind when you hear the accreditation. Then when we have the accountability, uh, that is really uh, talking about the um, how schools are, are doing, the per their performance, how are they moving forward in uh, making progress towards their action plans, making progress in student growth, making progress in just what they do with their schools. So keep in mind all of those definitions as you hear about approval, accreditation, and accountability. Um, with a, a accountability, we, you're looking at your data. So with that, we're going to go on to the what. Right now, what is this all about? Why are we talking about this? Currently, we have two rules, Rule 10 and Rule 14, that we are using to guide our approval and our accreditation process. Our Rule 10, Regulations and Procedures for the Accreditation of Schools, which was uh, last updated in 2015, so it's been a few years, uh, deals with our, all of our public schools, the minimum requirements that they have to function as a school. So it's the regulations and procedures and um, I know your superintendents are all very aware of Rule 10 and the regulations and re requirements that they need to meet. They submit an assurance statement and so forth. So we're looking at that is what currently we're using is the Rule 10. 
For our non-public schools, we have our regulation procedures for the legal operation of approval of non-public schools, which hasn't been updated since 2012. But that is for all of our non-public schools have to meet those minimum requirements to be approved. Now, non-public schools have the option to be accredited also at this time, and there is a process outlined in Rule 10 that they can use to um, um, become accredited, uh, but they have to ask for that accreditation, otherwise they are approved. But you can kind of see as I'm talking about Rule 10 and Rule 14 that there may be some confusion, uh, some lack of clarity and what is, what do we mean by Rule 10? What do we mean by Rule 14? Which schools is it for? Is it for public? Is it for non-public? And so one of the things that we're hoping to do as is make work on our clarity of rules so that everybody understands what rule they need to be using as they are moving forward. Um, so what is this also, what is this all about? It's also about um, making sure that um, our non-public schools that, excuse me, make sure that we don't have any confusion around the approval, around the process at all, and that we can tie together what's happening in Rule 10 and Rule 14, that there is similar terminology, that there is kind of a through line between what happens with public and with non-public schools. So why are we doing this now? We have started this process almost two years ago of looking at how can we change Rule 10 and Rule 14 was pulled into that also. And so um, it really is the first thing is what I've been talking about is to provide some clarity to you, um, provide clarity for our schools that we're uh, separating our general compliance from accreditation. We're separating approval from accreditation. And so all schools, no matter what, if they are public or non-public, will go through the approval rule, the approval process, so that there is no question of what, what does it mean to be an approved school. The other thing is to try to create some, some coherence. We are looking for links that, that go from approval through accreditation through accountability. Because uh, we're in the process of really putting those three rules together into an accreditation system, a system of accreditation, a way that schools will function from approval, accreditation into, uh, uh, accreditation into accountability. So we're looking to create more coherence between the rules, no matter if you're a public or a non-public school. Also, we're trying to provide some equity with limited resources. We are not going to be gaining any additional resources for, from NDE to provide to our school districts with this process, and, but we are trying to look at what can we do differently in our services, our support that we provide from NDE to our school. So we are looking to create a multi-cycle accreditation system as part of this process. What that means is that right now, all school districts have, and, and non-public schools that want to be accredited, every five years, you have an on-site visit and you uh, have to have uh, an outside team come in. They give you accommodations, recommendations on things that you are uh, need to improve, things that you're doing really well, and that's submitted to the district, and they're looking at your continuous improvement plan, they're looking at your process, your CIP process, how does your teams are developed, how does your teams function, and then progress towards your goals through your action plans. And so uh, that is what we are doing currently, but it's every five years, no matter what. Well, we are looking that we know that we've been doing this long enough now that we know that um, there are school districts that do very, very well, and that maybe they don't need to have somebody coming on site and giving them recommendations, accommodations every five years. They could probably go seven years. We're not thinking that this is a large amount of schools, but there are schools that really do very, very well. They have it, they understand continuous improvement, their students are making progress, and so we are going to let them go every seven years instead of five years. But we also know that we have some schools that need more support, nor more help. And so we are uh, going to have a three year, every three years instead of every five years. So this allows us to put our resources to the schools most in need. And so we can, those schools that we feel are struggling, that need more uh, assistance, 
uh, maybe a little more understanding of what continuous improvement is, we will be able to provide more resources for them uh, and be able and have them be able to demonstrate that they are making progress every three years. The majority of our schools will be falling in the five-year cycle. So we're looking at creating a three-year, five-year, seven-year cycle with the, the new accreditation process. We also want to ensure appropriate stakeholder involvement. Over the last year, we have been talking to anybody and everybody that we can. We started with our NDE, uh, individuals having them come in and meet with us prior to pandemic and meet with us and, and talk to us about um, what they would like to see changed in rule 10 or what would they like to have changed in rule 14, getting that feedback. We have, we have talked to other school districts. We have talked to uh, superintendents, uh, principals. Uh, now we're sharing with you and we're gonna have an opportunity for you to share information with us also. But we also have what is called our state accreditation committee that meets twice a year. That is a, that is a representatives across the state of all size schools. And it has some non-educators on it also. And, um, and they're across the state. And it's a 23 member board right now and they are advisory to the commissioner. We bounce ideas off of them every time we meet and they give us pushback and they, we have presented uh, ideas to them that they said, no way, that's not gonna work, take it back and come back with something else. And so we have been getting our feedback very much, but we also want to get feedback from our school boards and we want to make sure that our school boards, as we move forward in the new rules, is that there is a little more involvement with our school boards, a little more knowledge, especially around the, like the assurance statement, that one of our new uh, regulations that we are recommending and the approval rule is that the superintendent shares with the board their assurance statement and what they are reporting and have a representative of the school board sign off on that also. So that they're aware of, of the assurance statement to begin with, but then also what is the, what is the information that they are sharing with us as far as uh, meeting the guidelines that are in the rule. So this all started with the board position statement S2 from uh, accountability for a quality educational system today and tomorrow. Everybody heard of, I've heard of AQUEST, I'm assuming, but the state board would like AQUEST to serve as the framework for approval, accreditation, and accountability. And you will see that as you look at it, that the tenants of AQUEST fall within the three broad domains of leadership, success, access, and support, and teaching, learning, and serving. And then there are six uh, tenants. Um, so in October of 2020, the state board said that they, they kind of put a stake in the ground and they said in moving forward, we're going to repeal current rule 10 and 14. We are going to have three new rules, approval, accreditation, accountability that will make up an, an accreditation system and keeping in mind what those approval, accreditation, accountability. And so we have been working very hard to make this happen. And I'm watching my time. So, um, so who has been involved in that? And I've kind of gone over this already. We started with our Nebraska Department of Education. We've been listening to our administrators, teachers, staff, and we're trying to get feedback from local school board. I have to stop and say that I really appreciate the work that we have been doing with Marsha and John at NASB because we have a great partnership that has developed about two years ago where we are meeting now quarterly and just keeping each other updated on what's happening on their side of things and what's happening on our side with approval and accreditation. And it's been a great partnership. And this is a result of some of that partnership is, is supporting us in our work as we move forward with this. I also have to talk about our educational service units. We have spent a lot of time with our ESUs. I hope all of you are working with your ESUs. They are great uh, organizations that support our schools. They, they also give us information. They listen to their schools and they're able to give us the information. But we also want to get the information from community members and get the word out what is happening and get feedback from our community members also. So how are we doing this? So up until this point, we are we kind of into our in game right now, even though it's only March, 
that that's the end of our first three months, January through March, we have been engaging stakeholders. Brad Dirksen, who is my uh, supervisor, has been out talking to service units, out talking to uh, other organizations, administrators, superintendents about this, about the process that we are using for, uh, as we are, the changes that we are making. And so we're almost to the end of that. So the middle of April, we hope to have the three draft rules available uh, with, for public online comment. And when, when we have the link to those ready, we will share that with Marcia and John and they will share that out with you so that you have an opportunity to actually read the, the draft rules and give us input of what you, what you think they're saying to us. We're looking for clarity, we're looking for understanding, we're looking for things you agree with, things that you don't agree with. So that in between July and September, we're gonna take all of that information and finalize our draft so that by the, by the board meeting in October, we're hoping to have the board be able to vote on the draft so that we can send those to the, the AG and the governor for their approval so that we have this approved in December of 2021. Implementation of it would not start until the fall of 22-23. Uh, we would take a semester to do some training, the rolling it out, talking to our schools, and there could even be some phase in of some of the uh, language that's in the rule also. So with that, I know I'm, I've kind of gone over my time. I want to thank all of you first for listening to me ramble on. And then also I want to thank you and your teachers and your uh, administrators for all of the hard work they've had for the last year and this year. Uh, it's phenomenal. It is just phenomenal the work that our schools have done to keep our kids in school and being educated and in, in a time like none before. So thank you, John, and thank you to all of the board members that are here. And, and again, thank you, Don. We appreciate this relationship, and it's, it's good to see uh, the board members out there uh, in action tonight. We can't wait to see you in person, so don't hesitate to reach out to NDE or NASB with questions, and you'll be getting that survey soon, and uh, this will conclude our workshop tonight. Thanks. Good seeing everybody. <laughs> All right, we will, I think if we're done there, yep. We'll move ahead to our action items. Uh, 7.1 is the workforce prep lease agreement for 2021 through 2023, Dr. Dexter. Yes, and I presented this last month. So this is on um, uh, the agenda for approval. And it is a lease with the Workforce Development, which is formerly known as the Coffee Shop or Islander Express. And um, we will be uh, leasing it. We did increase it by $100 a month. And the leasing for the initial period for three years beginning July 1, 2021, and can extend it one more year after that. Okay. Anybody have any questions? If not, I'd entertain an motion. Mr. Barsonis. I approve the lease agreement with Danny Oberg for the property at 644 South Locust for the Workforce Prep Academy as submitted. And is there a second? I think I heard Mrs. Albers a second. Please, or any discussion, sorry. Please vote. Okay, motion passes. We will move on to 7.2, which is the ITE rate 2021 GIPS wireless network upgrade, Mr. Gerhardt. Thank you. Um, bringing this back, we did uh, we did receive some proposals. We I, I brought this up. We had kind of a short time frame last month, and and because of the the way timing works for the E rate program um, to get the reimbursement of the 80 cents on the dollar, um, we had to move and and have it done before. We, Bring it for information and then now for action tonight. Um, there were, uh, in this case, three proposals. Um, we had a proposal from uh, Citronet that did not conform and was was rejected. We uh, had another proposal from CDW that um, met only part of the, the requirements for the RFP. Um, in this case, they, they bid the equipment, but none of the services required to get it up and running. And so that wasn't... Uh, wasn't something that we were going to fall through with, so we also rejected that bid. So we really only have one valid bidder. Um, 
which is prime communication. The, um, the pricing is uh, definitely in line, if not more advantageous than I've seen in the past um, with this particular product set. Um, so I, I have no reservations about entering into it. Um, essentially what they're gonna do is, uh, we have about 400 access points and a couple of controllers. We, we need to upgrade our wireless system to move it to the next generation of code in order to continue to, to grow and, and to meet the demands of the additional bandwidth that um, students and, and staff need. So um, with that, I would recommend that we um, enter into an agreement with Prime Communications um, for the amount of $354,923 with the understanding that um, $280,000 of that 281,000 approximately will be part of the E-rate reimbursement. That'll be funded and paid directly to Prime. And so the general fund impact um, out of my capital equipment budget is going to be $73,971. Okay. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Mr. Gerhardt? Okay. If not, I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Brown. I would move to approve the purchase of wireless equipment and services from Prime Communications as presented. And is there a second? Second. Second, Mrs. Albers. Any discussion? Please vote. Okay, motion passes. 7.3 is the ITE rate for 2021 GISH wired network upgrade, Mr. Gerhardt. So fairly similar process through the E-rate program. Uh, we put the RFP out, did information on it last month. We received four bids um, for this proposal. That same company you might notice before, um, it's essentially, uh, they just inundated you with, uh, with product brochures and told you to figure out your own program and so Obviously, it doesn't, didn't conform. Again, so that bid was rejected. Um, NetDiverse did a little bit closer, actually uh, gave some bids for specific products and, and things and uh, that would be used, but obviously the price tag is astronomical, um, $3 million. I mean, it's an order of magnitude above where we, we are with the other two vendors. Um, Hamilton and Kidwell both um, gave proposals. Um, we, you know, this is one of those things where when you look at RFPs, um, you have to be, uh, you have to be particular about what you're asking for. And in this case, we asked for, you know, ComScope compatible um, cabling and, and connectors because that's the district SOP. And so at this point, the only, the only team that actually bid that was Kidwell. However, um, Hamilton's bid did um, give us enough information to determine that the cabling and connectors that they were bidding on the spec were compatible 100% um, with the product. And so uh, we already have a mixed environment in GISH, and this was an opportunity, um, obviously, to work with a local vendor and to get a similar 25-year warranty out of the product. And so after reviewing, after meeting their team, doing our due diligence, um, we are recommending that we go with the, the low bidder here, which is Hamilton uh, Communications. For a, a price tag of $394,110 of that, um, the E-rate discount will be uh, not quite 80% of that if you do the math. We, we do have some things that are excluded because, for example, um, we can't E-rate cabling that's designed solely for uh, CCTV systems because that's not a direct impact to network delivery to students and so or staff. And so um, we did exclude those services that aren't in there and that's why the percentage or the discounts looks a little bit lower and the, the GIPS general fund percentage is a little higher. So the, uh, the expense to the general fund is going to be 129183 dollars and that will be uh, split funded between myself and Mr. Petch. Okay. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Dr. Bros. I'd move that the board approve the purchase of equipment and, and services from Hamilton Telecommunications as presented. And is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. 
Oh, go. Why don't you go ahead and share that verbally? <laughs> Sorry, my husband is Adam Jurgen, so he's the salesperson for Hamilton. So I definitely can't. Okay. Contribute. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or discussions? If not, please vote. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move to the committee reports. First one is 8.1, Finance and Facilities, Mr. Brown. Thank you, I'll be reporting from the minutes from March 2nd. We reviewed a couple of proposals, one for Howard Elementary School roofing, Another was the document management services, which Mr. Gerhardt explained this evening. Um, the Trish, we got an update from Nutrition Services. Again, at that point, they were gearing up for meal distribution during spring break. Um, also, that the Titan um, system, uh, the computer system, will be going live March 22nd. Uh, with um, IT as well, we had an update on this, that CenturyLink is now Lumen. Um, and a new agreement will be in place um, instead of using CenturyLink uh, to be Lumen, and there are some differences between that. Uh, let's see. Um, other programs, um, the, the uh, depreciation fund, special building fund, general fund, all were reviewed, as well as the federal programs, which um, is always fun. Um, we did review the annexation agreement, which was mentioned this evening. Again, that's a process of when the city grow, um, grows um, the annex and property. We've had a long-standing relationship with, with Northwest on the agreement that um, came in place and been using the same agreement every time. So really never been an issue uh, once we've got that figured out. Um, We did get an update on the Welcome um, Center space. So the Welcome Center, for those of you who don't know, is up at the um, the health department. Um, and <laughs> the health department's kind of busy right now. And they need more of their space. So we are losing the space. So we're actively trying to find some space for them to um, fit in. Um, it's been really nice to have them at the Welcome Center, but um, unfortunately, um, they need the space uh, just as much as we do. Uh, we did get an update from Mr. Harden on the CARES Act, and again, we're kind of a wait and see on on what's going to happen and and, and whatnot on that. Um, <laughs> is there is that a call? Oh oh ah, it's putting too much pressure on me. <laughs> um. We did get the presentation from Amerisco. Oh, does that say, say that right? Uh, probably not. Um, also had an update from Mr. Harden on his transition planning. Um, we did review the regional planning notes and planning on the um, early childhood um, tour on March 26th. Uh, with that, I conclude my report. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, March 30th at 7.30. All right, thank you. 8.2 is leading for learning committee committee, Mr. Helinski. Uh, we met uh, March second. Um, went over a little bit on the uh, the case uh, the, the CKLA, which we kind of listened to a little bit uh, this evening. Um, also talked about uh, the six to eight my perspective student books. Uh, Dr. Bills provided us an update on those getting those books uh, for the six to eighth grade students to get a little better high quality instruction materials for the next couple years. Uh, she's supposed to report back to us for the board for next month for approval. Went over Dibbles and Map updates, which uh, we've got to see that this evening as well. And then we uh, kind of touched base a little bit on the K K through 12 Science PE, and the health uh, health coordinator provided an update on the district science standards um, and the next generation science standards, which um, everything is going to be kind of coming together with that with the real world experiences. We kind of talked about what they were doing before and what they're going to be set to do uh, and the map science scores assessments is currently not aligned with those um, and GSS standards so we wanted to have make sure they have a little more accurate data to determine that our students are progressing in the right direction um, and the recommendation to suspend <coughs> map science and monitor <coughs> students progress throughout the ongoing benchmark assessments through the Synergy uh, so our students can have a better management system there 
Um, Dr. Palmer also provided a brief overview of the summer core advantage learning opportunities and the, and the for the planning for this summer for the students and proposed the outcomes will uh, revolve around address addressing unfinished learning acceleration of learning for students performing below benchmark and credit renewal to support transition for K uh, grades pre pre K excuse me K fifth sixth seventh eighth and ninth uh, and a more formal overview will be coming uh, once we get all that stuff kind of hashed out there so and then our meeting concluded with a review from uh, Erica Wolf on chapter one of a book we're kind of all gotten taken apart of with the grading for equity book uh, uh, Mrs. Wolf described Ms. Wolf had described that the grading practices are complex based on the web uh, beliefs and uh, had a really nice presentation and kind of made me nervous because I'm coming up and she had everything mapped out there. So, uh, <laughs> so but I got a couple more chapters, but we're going to be going through that next month and we're going to hear uh, from everybody else that was reading chapters two through seven. And our next meeting is April 6th at four. And that is the report from the minutes of that meeting. All right. Thank you very much. 8.3 is the personnel committee. Mr. Hawley. I'll be reporting on the minutes from March 3rd. Uh, Mr. Stoke updated the committee on the AROI and strategic budgeting work being completed with the district administrators. Most recently, the administrators engaged in a process of identifying recommendations to include the 2021-22 budget, developing equity formulas and suggesting programs for consideration for an academic return on investment analysis. Next steps will be to complete an AROI analysis, <laughs> creating more specif specificity in the recommended budgeting priorities developing equity formulas, and to identify resources to fund those priorities. The committee also discussed factors impacting the 2021-22 budgeting and staffing process and emphasized the importance of applying the recommendations from the comprehensive staffing analysis to help meet, up, to help meet upcoming fiscal challenges. Certified staff contract rules were distributed to teachers and administrators on April 1st with a due date of April 15th. The substitute teacher fill rate still continues to be strong, averaging 94.75% fill rate. Uh, the staffing update, certified staffing, the district has received 31 certified retirements and resignations. Each certified vacancy is being reviewed carefully before making decisions to fill. Classified staffing, human resources is recruiting to fill several vacancies, custodians, uh, paraeducators, nutrition services, temporary yard workers, maintenance workers, bilingual parents, and technology assistants. Uh, administrative staffing, the CFO position uh, and offer had at that point been extended and they're awaiting the decision. We now have, have that position awarded. Uh, the Chief of Human Capital Management will be posted once the CFO position is filled, so I'm unsure if that's happened yet. CIA coordinator, uh, candidates are being screened. Special Education Supervisor position has been posted. The MTSS coordinator uh, candidates are being screened and the principal uh, for the Academy of Education Law and Public Safety candidates are being screened as well. Staff adjustments uh, were received and accepted as presented. The next meeting will be on March 31st at 8.30 a.m. And this concludes my report. Okay, thank you very much. 8.4 is the policy committee, Mr. Brown. Thank you all for reporting for minutes from March 8th. Um, the um, policies that we reviewed, um, 7375, request for consideration of instruction and library collections. We did have a, quite a discussion on this and basically review the, the, some comments from the L4L committee came through and a lot of the languages were basically um, altered um, for the resources um, and that, that will be moved forward for approval. Uh, the 4440 purchasing authority um, basically looking at um, uh, the way that we do our, our purchasing and just cleaned up some of that language and that will be moved forward along with the 4442 um, local purchasing. Um, they're kind of combined. The 8440 um, use of tobacco, alcohol, and collect and controlled substances by students basically updating. Um, the vaping um, violation policy in that one. Also under 8450, the student discipline, we're working with the guidance counselors on the policies equity analysis framework to be involved in that one. The 87 or 8570 drug-free school and campuses, we're basically updating the definitions of, the, of tobacco and non-tobacco products. 
Um, well, we did have a update on the review policy of, of for the equity analysis um, to be included, and also um, had a presentation, a little presentation, a discussion from Dr. Dexter and Dr. Grover on um, the template that will be used for the equity analysis. Um, we had uh, a, just a discussion on the parent um, student handbook that we saw this evening and approved or moved forward. And with that, um, we did table uh, quite a few um, policies. Um, our next policy uh, meeting will be April 12th at 4.30. All right. Thank you very much. 8.5 is the public relations and partnership development. Mr. Barsonis. Perfect. That's okay. Don't worry. Well, you'll take it next month. <laughs> um, well, being on the street is what we started with. Our meeting was March 5th, and uh, we really started with a lot of uh, positive comments around teachers getting vaccinated and uh, um, the plans for prom and graduation. A lot of positive stuff coming up, and I might need uh, Dr. Dexter's uh, help here because you thought my last name was hard. So Families in Transition Program, Dr. Dester and uh, Mrs. Is it, there you go, right? <laughs> so Bo Slager and uh, yes, yeah, so uh, give us an, a, an update on the Families in Transition Program and just uh, what, what they have going on and especially some of the, the hurdles and stuff with COVID, with homeless students and a lot of the good work that they're doing. Uh, I think they've been I know I've heard in the community from some of the families that have been impacted from the program. It's just been uh, a good place to be. So um, we spent a little bit of time also. We continue to talk with uh, with the sharing information with the governance committee about um, Kendall. Well, Kendall's position in the sense of how do we continue to improve the communication of what does the student rep and his role play and how can we help spread the word not only at the high school but also at uh, earlier, earlier grades. Um, Jennifer K gave us an update on our social media calendar, and I'm sure many of you remember. Probably Kendall is the only one that years, years, years ago when it was a no-no to be on Facebook when you were at work, and now things have changed. Uh, we've had uh, live with Grover, possibly Instagram with Grover as well, and maybe soon TikTok with Tawana. So we'll see. <laughs> the group asked about. What is the role of TikTok and what are we going to be doing with that? And again, oh media platforms keep changing, so we need to keep uh, updating with it. Um, we've gotten a lot of, a lot of uh, media coverage from uh, Nebraska Los Public Schools with COVID, um, with uh, avi aviation, all the, the, the stuff that was out there. Um, also, Ms. Albers and Julie Quartermaker were, the, were in the news helping with the vaccines. So a lot of good uh, coverage that we've had. We talked and shared more about the heartbeat and in your notes, there's a couple of links. Otherwise, it's on the YouTube uh, and our social media pages about the heartbeat with uh, basketball and wrestling. And uh, again, a lot of positive and I think it's been a lot of good heartwarming stories and a real authentic connection with what we have happening. Um, spent some time talking about an op-ed that was uh, yesterday in the Independent about the anniversary of uh, COVID. So if you haven't seen it, I think it was published in our Facebook page today as well, or shared. And um, equity task for just a quick update that we do have eight work groups right now. They're working and developing their plans. Um, continue to talk about website updates. That's still a work in progress and just general updates. And our next meeting is April 1st at 8 a.m. And with that, I conclude my report. All right, thank you. Grand Island Public Schools Foundation reports, Mrs. Jerkins. Thank you. Am, am I on? Okay. All right, I'm reporting on the March 15th meeting. All students who graduate summa or magna cum laude will be honored at an academic honor ceremony at Gish Auditorium on April 14th at 7 p.m. These same students will receive a scholarship from the GIPS Foundation as long as they submitted a scholarship application. Due to the pandemic, we are holding a limited in-person event. Students will be able to attend with two guests. Yay. We will also stream that evening. Home Federal is the corporate sponsor of that event. Mrs. Skalberg did already cover the added up to opportunity. 
The foundation board has restructured and reappointed committees and chairs to align with our strategic framework. The foundation delivered over $35,000 in grants to the district the first week of March. Included at the end of the report is a summary of the grants. There were 10 classroom mini grants totaling $11,174 to teachers for classroom projects that add value to the curriculum. In addition to the Grand Island Public Schools Foundation presented a dual enrollment grant of $23,000 to the Career Pathways Institute to help cover the cost of dual enrollment tuition for students of CPI. And the Grand Island Public Schools Foundation also presented a certificate for the Dr. E. Eugene Miller Legacy Scholarship to Ethan Moseman. This scholarship is a $1,000 award to a Grand Island Public Schools certified teacher, counselor, or administrator pursuing a postgraduate, excuse me, pursuing postgraduate level coursework. And sorry, I'm missing my note on our next meeting, and I thought I had it here, but I don't. Talk about legislation. So, is it true that it'd be this Wednesday? That sounds right because I answered a Google invite. Okay. For that time. <laughs> so, yes. All right. Would be correct. Thank you. All right. Um, 8.7 is the governance committee, and Mrs. Albers is going to present. We met on March 3rd. Do you want me to do the spreadsheet to review or just go into the. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So um, we spent a lot of time talking about. Kendall's position <laughs> um, just maybe creating a policy uh, regarding that position also marketing the role like uh, Carlos talked about and maybe creating it as a capstone project uh, working with Gish, Gish admin to just give the student a little bit more responsibility possibly creating a student legislative committee what exactly that would look like would there be interest in that um, also then um, creating a job description for the superintendent student advisory group as well. Um, policies to review were 2111, 2215, 2311, 3210, 3212. And um, let me just talk about the superintendent evaluation on the 2021 calendar and then looking at the evaluation form and then that whole process and we need to set a date for our next meeting but I don't remember what it is, so, okay. All right, 8.8 um, .8 is the GNSA uh, Legislative Committee update. I did send an email out to all the board members just to let you know what we're doing, but uh, first of all, we did put together this one-page sheet that highlights three bills that we're in favor of and two bills that um, we are opposed to. Obviously, there's a lot of others, but these are the ones that we deem of highest priority. So the ones we're in favor of, is 323 which is the hold harmless bill uh, with regards to how COVID has impacted schools uh, this one's important to us because you know for example we've had student loss this year and the TOSA formula is impacted by that and so the TOSA formula would not look at that and there's other things in there too but that's just an example of what that means LB 132 is create the school financing review commission uh, this is one we really support because right now it seems like there's a lot of individual bills that try to do something to school financing and the formula. And when they're done in isolation, they have a tendency to have an unintended consequences. And so we really think this commission would be good. An amendment was um, put forward that clearly spells out that there would be a representative from a school district of our size, a board member. Uh, one from uh, the size of Omaha and so forth. And so it's going to have very good representation. Of course, state legislators would be on it, individuals from the ag community. So we really think that that would be a good bill. And it did get out of committee on a 7 0 vote. LB 529 changes uh, the provisions of distribution of lottery funds. If this bill isn't passed, the current distribution of lottery funds would sunset and then. So who knows what would happen. So it's important that it gets reauthorized. And then of course, the two that uh, we're highlighting that, um, and today we were able to share this with the 
key communicators, we did a presentation to them, was LB408, which is adopt the property tax request and LR22CA, which is a constitutional amendment. And they both do pretty much the same thing, which is if our property taxes in Grand Island increase above 3%, we can only lev levy up to 3% increase. However, the TIOSA formula would recognize the full impact, so like the full amount, and so we, we get dinged twice on it. Um, and we just don't think that that's a good bill. And Open Sky helped us present to the Chamber of Commerce last week on that bill because the State Chamber of Commerce is in support of the bill. Uh, and so they did a evaluation of how this would impact Grand Island, public schools, and fiscal year 2013 to 2018, if this bill had been in effect, we would have lost $4 million. The city of Grand Island in that same time frame would have lost 2.2 million. So it, it definitely has an impact. And then LB 364 is the Adopt the Opportunity Scholarships Act. Um, we've met with the Education Foundation to share this with them because it does treat um, tax credits for uh, these scholarships for private schools more generously, much more generously than it does any other nonprofit. So it would have, not only would it have a huge impact on the schools, but it also will on nonprofits. And um, so we did also meet with Senator Aguilar earlier, or lot, late last week to provide information on these bills as well. And whenever there's a GNSA meeting, I attend those on Friday afternoons now, the notes from those are out on the committee. If you're ever interested, you can go out there and, and read the notes. And Lisa, is there anything from NASB that you'd like to update us on? Okay. And she handed out these books, and so we're pretty famous. Yes. Dr. and Mrs. Albers are on the front here in their face masks. And then I noticed that if you go to page six, Mr. Barsonis, it's when we first started distributing lunches at Walnut Middle School, and it was so early on, we're not even wearing face masks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it was way before we, we knew we needed to be doing that. So. All right, so that ends my report. We are continuing to meet on a monthly basis. Just so you know, priority bills were due by last Friday. Um, so it is moving into the floor debate now. And so we're watching as any of the bills move forward. All right, 8.9 is the NASB monthly update. It's attached there for you. There's a video or a printed edition. It really focused again on the legislative issues. Marsha Herring talked about different training that's going on, and they talked about the meeting that we saw tonight. Nine point, or agenda nine, sorry, is an executive session for the purpose, purpose of real estate because it is in the best interest of the public to discuss this matter in closed session. Do I have a recommendation? Mrs. Albers. Um, I make a motion um, that the board convene to executive session for the purpose of discussing real estate. Real estate. I was like, it's not on there. Real estate. <laughs> <laughs>
agenda item 10 is reconvene from executive session. I need a motion. Mrs. I'd Albers. Like to make a motion to reconvene from executive session. <laughs> Second, Mr. Barsonis. <laughs> Please vote. Okay, motion passes. Uh, agenda item 11, there is no approval needed of any action deemed necessary as a result of the executive session. So agenda item 12 is notification of upcoming board meetings. 